Preface In the 19th century, there were two extraordinary individuals, Napoleon Bonaparte and Helen Keller. Mark Twain, once the beauty of the human spirit is recognized, it remains etched in our memories forever. Miss Keller, through her life and joy of living, has taught us, who face fewer challenges, an unforgettable lesson. We hope that this book reaches an ever-growing number of readers, spreading her spirit across wider horizons. Mrs. Roosevelt, Preface, Embarking on the journey of writing my memoir, tracing the path of my life from birth until now, fills me with a sense of both awe and trepidation. A mysterious veil shrouds my childhood, and lifting it raises numerous doubts within me. Writing a memoir is a daunting task in itself, and when it comes to a distant childhood, it becomes even more challenging. I find myself unable to distinguish between what is factual and what is merely my own illusions and imaginings. However, amidst the fragments of memories that remain, certain events continue to vividly flash in my mind, albeit in isolated fragments. These fragments have left their mark, to varying degrees, on my life. To avoid tediousness, I will only recount the most intriguing and valuable episodes. I was born on June 27, 1880, in Tuscumbia, a little town of northern Alabama. The family on my father's side is descended from Caspar Keller, a native of Switzerland, who settled in Maryland. One of my Swiss ancestors was the first teacher of the deaf in Zurich and wrote a book on the subject of their education. Rather a singular coincidence. Though it is true that there is no king who has not had a slave among his ancestors, and no slave who has not had a king among his. My grandfather, Caspar Keller's son, entered large tracts of land in Alabama and finally settled there. I have been told that once a year he went from Tuscumbia to Philadelphia on horseback to purchase supplies for the plantation, and my aunt has in her possession many of the letters to his family, which give charming and vivid accounts of these trips. My grandmother Keller was a daughter of one of Lafayette's aides, Alexander Moore, and granddaughter of Alexander Spotswood, an early colonial governor of Virginia. She was also second cousin to Robert E. Lee. My father, Arthur H. Keller, was a captain in the Confederate Army, and my mother, Kate Adams, was his second wife and many years younger. Her grandfather, Benjamin Adams, married Susanna E. Goodhue, and lived in Newberry, Massachusetts, for many years. Their son, Charles Adams, was born in Newburyport, Massachusetts, and moved to Helena, Arkansas. When the Civil War broke out, he fought on the side of the South and became a brigadier general. He married Lucy Helen Everett, who belonged to the same family of Everett's as Edward Everett and Dr. Edward Everett Hale. After the war was over the family moved to Memphis, Tennessee. I lived, up to the time of the illness that deprived me of my sight and hearing, in a tiny house consisting of a large square room and a small one, in which the servants slept. It is a custom in the South to build a small house near the homestead as an annex to be used on occasion. Such a house my father built after the Civil War, and when he married my mother they went to live in it. It was completely covered with vines, climbing roses and honeysuckles. From the garden it looked like an arbor. The little porch was hidden from view by a screen of yellow roses and southern smilax. It was the favorite haunt of hummingbirds and bees. The Keller homestead, where the family lived, was a few steps from our little rose bower. It was called, Ivy Green, because the house and the surrounding trees and fences were covered with beautiful English ivy. Its old-fashioned garden was the paradise of my childhood. Even in the days before my teacher came, I used to feel along the square stiff boxwood hedges, and, guided by the sense of smell would find the first violets and lilies. There, too, after a fit of temper, 
I went to find comfort and to hide my hot face in the cool leaves and grass. What joy it was to lose myself in that garden of flowers, to wander happily from spot to spot, until, coming suddenly upon a beautiful vine, I recognized it by its leaves and blossoms, and knew it was the vine which covered the tumble-down summer house at the farther end of the garden. Here, also, were trailing clematis, drooping jessamine, and some rare sweet flowers called butterfly lilies, because their fragile petals resemble butterflies' wings. But the roses, they were loveliest of all. Never have I found in the greenhouses of the North such heart-satisfying roses as the climbing roses of my southern home. They used to hang in long festoons from our porch, filling the whole air with their fragrance, untainted by any earthy smell. And in the early morning, washed in the dew, they felt so soft, so pure, I could not help wondering if they did not resemble the asphodels of God's garden. The beginning of my life was simple and much like every other little life. I came, I saw, I conquered, as the first baby in the family always does. There was the usual amount of discussion as to a name for me. The first baby in the family was not to be lightly named, everyone was emphatic about that. My father suggested the name of Mildred Campbell, an ancestor whom he highly esteemed, and he declined to take any further part in the discussion. My mother solved the problem by giving it as her wish that I should be called after her mother, whose maiden name was Helen Everett. But in the excitement of carrying me to church my father lost the name on the way, very naturally, since it was one in which he had declined to have a part. When the minister asked him for it, he just remembered that it had been decided to call me after my grandmother, and he gave her name as Helen Adams. I am told that while I was still in long dresses I showed many signs of an eager, self-asserting disposition. Everything that I saw other people do I insisted upon imitating. At six months I could pipe out, how day, and one day I attracted everyone's attention by saying, T, 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 quite plainly. Even after my illness I remembered one of the words I had learned in these early months. It was the word, water, and I continued to make some sound for that word after all other speech was lost. I ceased making the sound, wah wah, only when I learned to spell the word. They tell me I walked the day I was a year old. My mother had just taken me out of the bathtub and was holding me in her lap, when I was suddenly attracted by the flickering shadows of leaves that danced in the sunlight on the smooth floor. I slipped from my mother's lap and almost ran toward them. The impulse gone, I fell down and cried for her to take me up in her arms. These happy days did not last long. One brief spring, musical with the song of robin and mockingbird, one summer rich in fruit and roses, one autumn of gold and crimson sped by and left their gifts at the feet of an eager, delighted child. Then, in the dreary month of February, came the illness which closed my eyes and ears and plunged me into the unconsciousness of a newborn baby. They called it acute congestion of the stomach and brain. The doctor thought I could not live. Early one morning, however, the fever left me as suddenly and mysteriously as it had come. There was great rejoicing in the family that morning, but no one, not even the doctor, knew that I should never see or hear again. I fancy I still have confused recollections of that illness. I especially remember the tenderness with which my mother tried to soothe me in my wailing hours of fret and pain, and the agony and bewilderment with which I awoke after a tossing half-sleep, and turned my eyes, so dry and hot, to the wall away from the once-loved light, which came to me dim and yet more dim each day. But, except for these fleeting memories, if, indeed, they be memories, it all seems very unreal, like a nightmare. Gradually I got used to the silence and darkness that surrounded me and forgot that it had ever been different, until she came, my teacher, 
who was to set my spirit free. But during the first 19 months of my life I had caught glimpses of broad, green fields, a luminous sky, trees and flowers which the darkness that followed could not wholly blot out. If we have once seen, the day is ours, and what the day has shown. Chapter 2 I cannot recall what happened during the first months after my illness. I only know that I sat in my mother's lap or clung to her dress as she went about her household duties. My hands felt every object and observed every motion, and in this way I learned to know many things. Soon I felt the need of some communication with others and began to make crude signs. A shake of the head meant, no, and a nod, yes, a pull meant, come, and a push, go. Was it bread that I wanted? Then I would imitate the acts of cutting the slices and buttering them. If I wanted my mother to make ice cream for dinner I made the sign for working the freezer and shivered, indicating cold. My mother, moreover, succeeded in making me understand a good deal. I always knew when she wished me to bring her something, and I would run upstairs or anywhere else she indicated. Indeed, I owe to her loving wisdom all that was bright and good in my long night. I understood a good deal of what was going on about me. At five I learned to fold and put away the clean clothes when they were brought in from the laundry, and I distinguished my own from the rest. I knew by the way my mother and aunt dressed when they were going out, and I invariably begged to go with them. I was always sent for when there was company, and when the guests took their leave, I waved my hand to them, I think with a vague remembrance of the meaning of the gesture. One day some gentlemen called on my mother, and I felt the shutting of the front door and other sounds that indicated their arrival. On a sudden thought I ran upstairs before anyone could stop me, to put on my idea of a company dress. Standing before the mirror, as I had seen others do, I anointed mine head with oil and covered my face thickly with powder. Then I pinned a veil over my head so that it covered my face and fell in folds down to my shoulders, and tied an enormous bustle round my small waist, so that it dangled behind, almost meeting the hem of my skirt. Thus attired I went down to help entertain the company. I do not remember when I first realized that I was different from other people, but I knew it before my teacher came to me. I had noticed that my mother and my friends did not use signs as I did when they wanted anything done, but talked with their mouths. Sometimes I stood between two persons who were conversing and touched their lips. I could not understand, and was vexed. I moved my lips and gesticulated frantically without result. This made me so angry at times that I kicked and screamed until I was exhausted. I think I knew when I was naughty, for I knew that it hurt Ella, my nurse, to kick her, and when my fit of temper was over I had a feeling akin to regret. But I cannot remember any instance in which this feeling prevented me from repeating the naughtiness when I failed to get what I wanted. In those days a little colored girl, Martha Washington, the child of our cook, and Belle, an old setter, and a great hunter in her day, were my constant companions. Martha Washington understood my signs, and I seldom had any difficulty in making her do just as I wished. It pleased me to domineer over her, and she generally submitted to my tyranny rather than risk a hand-to-hand -hand encounter. I was strong, active, indifferent to consequences. I knew my own mind well enough and always had my own way, even if I had to fight tooth and nail for it. We spent a great deal of time in the kitchen, kneading dough balls, helping make ice cream, grinding coffee, quarreling over the cake bowl, and feeding the hens and turkeys that swarmed about the kitchen steps. Many of them were so tame that they would eat from my hand and let me feel them. One big gobbler snatched a tomato from me one day and ran away with it. Inspired, perhaps, by Master Gobbler's success, 
We carried off to the wood pile a cake which the cook had just frosted, and ate every bit of it. I was quite ill afterward, and I wonder if retribution also overtook the turkey. The guinea fowl likes to hide her nest in out-of-the-way places, and it was one of my greatest delights to hunt for the eggs in the long grass. I could not tell Martha Washington when I wanted to go egg hunting, but I would double my hands and put them on the ground, which meant something round in the grass, and Martha always understood. When we were fortunate enough to find a nest I never allowed her to carry the eggs home, making her understand by emphatic signs that she might fall and break them. The sheds where the corn was stored, the stable where the horses were kept, and the yard where the cows were milked morning and evening were unfailing sources of interest to Martha and me. The milkers would let me keep my hands on the cows while they milked, and I often got well switched by the cow for my curiosity. The making ready for Christmas was always a delight to me. Of course I did not know what it was all about, but I enjoyed the pleasant odors that filled the house and the tidbits that were given to Martha Washington and me to keep us quiet. We were sadly in the way, but that did not interfere with our pleasure in the least. They allowed us to grind the spices, pick over the raisins and lick the stirring spoons. I hung my stocking because the others did. I cannot remember, however, that the ceremony interested me especially, nor did my curiosity cause me to wake before daylight to look for my gifts. Martha Washington had as great a love of mischief as I. Two little children were seated on the veranda steps one hot July afternoon. One was black as ebony, with little bunches of fuzzy hair tied with shoestrings sticking out all over her head like corkscrews. The other was white, with long golden curls. One child was six years old, the other two or three years older. The younger child was blind, that was I, and the other was Martha Washington. We were busy cutting out paper dolls, but we soon wearied of this amusement, and after cutting up our shoestrings and clipping all the leaves off the honeysuckle that were within reach, I turned my attention to Martha's corkscrews. She objected at first, but finally submitted. Thinking that turn and turn about is fair play, she seized the scissors and cut off one of my curls, and would have cut them all off but for my mother's timely interference. Belle, our dog, my other companion, was old and lazy and liked to sleep by the open fire rather than to romp with me. I tried hard to teach her my sign language, but she was dull and inattentive. She sometimes started and quivered with excitement, then she became perfectly rigid, as dogs do when they point a bird. I did not then know why Belle acted in this way, but I knew she was not doing as I wished. This vexed me and the lesson always ended in a one-sided boxing match. Belle would get up, stretch herself lazily, give one or two contemptuous sniffs, go to the opposite side of the hearth and lie down again, and I, wearied and disappointed, went off in search of Martha. Many incidents of those early years are fixed in my memory, isolated, but clear and distinct, making the sense of that silent, aimless, dayless life all the more intense. One day I happened to spill water on my apron, and I spread it out to dry before the fire which was flickering on the sitting room hearth. The apron did not dry quickly enough to suit me, so I drew nearer and threw it right over the hot ashes. The fire leapt into life, the flames encircled me so that in a moment my clothes were blazing. I made a terrified noise that brought Viney, my old nurse, to the rescue. Throwing a blanket over me, she almost suffocated me, but she put out the fire. Except for my hands and hair I was not badly burned. About this time I found out the use of a key. One morning I locked my mother up in the pantry, where she was obliged to remain three hours, as the servants were in a detached part of the house. 
She kept pounding on the door while I sat outside on the porch steps and laughed with glee as I felt the jar of the pounding. This most naughty prank of mine convinced my parents that I must be taught as soon as possible. After my teacher, Miss Sullivan, came to me, I sought an early opportunity to lock her in her room. I went upstairs with something which my mother made me understand I was to give to Miss Sullivan, but no sooner had I given it to her than I slammed the door to, locked it, and hid the key under the wardrobe in the hall. I could not be induced to tell where the key was. My father was obliged to get a ladder and take Miss Sullivan out through the window, much to my delight. Months after I produced the key. 3. In the vine-covered home, boundless motherly love, the young sister, unaware, finds solace in the cradle. Around the age of five, we moved from our vine-covered home to a larger house. Our family of six, father, mother, two half-brothers, and later, a little sister named Mildred. My earliest and clearest memory of my father is when I made my way to him through piles of newspapers. He was alone, holding a large paper sheet covering his chubby face. I had no idea what he was doing, so I imitated him, lifting a sheet of paper and putting on his glasses, thinking it would reveal the secret. It wasn't until many years later that I learned those papers were newspapers, and my father was an editor. My father had a gentle and kind nature. He loved our family deeply and rarely left us, except during hunting season. According to family members, he was a skilled hunter and marksman. Besides his family, his greatest loves were dogs and shotguns. He was very hospitable, perhaps overly so, bringing home one or two guests every time he returned. He also had a passion for gardening. Family members say that the watermelons and strawberries he grew were the best in the entire village. He always gave me the first ripe grapes and the finest strawberries to taste. He often took me for walks in the melon fields and orchards, stroking my hair and bringing me joy. Those memories remain vivid in my mind to this day. My father was also a master storyteller. After I learned to write, he would write many interesting events that had happened using the words I had learned onto the palm of my hand, making me burst into laughter with delight. And nothing made him happier than hearing me retell those stories he had shared. In 1896, while I was enjoying a summer vacation up north, I received the sudden news of my father's passing. His illness was brief, and after a sudden attack, he quickly passed away. It was my first taste of the bitter pain of parting, and my initial understanding of death. How should I describe my mother? She showered me with so much love that it's difficult to put into words. From birth until now, I have lived a carefree life, surrounded by the love of my parents. It wasn't until my sister Mildred joined our family that my heart started to feel restless and jealous. She sat on my mother's lap, taking my place, and it seemed like she had stolen my mother's time and attention. Then something happened that made me feel not only a division in maternal love but also a great insult. At that time, I had a beloved doll named Nancy. I cherished her and would vent my temper on her, leaving her in a sorry state. I often placed her in a cradle, just like my mother would soothe me. I loved her more than any blinking, talking doll. One day, I found my sister comfortably sleeping in the cradle. I was already jealous of her for taking away my mother's love, so how could I tolerate her sleeping in the cradle of my beloved Nancy? Enraged, I rushed over and forcefully overturned the cradle. If it hadn't been for my mother catching my sister in time, she might have been seriously injured. By that time, I was both blind and deaf, trapped in double isolation, unable to experience the warmth of language, 
affectionate gestures, or the emotions that arise between companions. Later, as I grew older and began to understand, I experienced the joys of human connection. Mildred and I became attuned to each other, holding hands as we wandered around, even though she couldn't understand my sign language and I couldn't hear her babbling childish voice. 4. Exhausted and overwhelmed with sorrow, hopeful teacher Sullivan has knowledge. As I grew older, the desire to express my thoughts and emotions became stronger. The repetitive hand gestures no longer sufficed. Every time sign language failed to convey my meaning, I would become furious. It felt as though invisible claws tightly gripped me, and I desperately wanted to break free. A fiery blaze burned within me, but I couldn't find a way to express it. Instead, I resorted to kicking, crying, rolling on the ground, and screaming until I was exhausted. When my mother was nearby, I would throw myself into her arms, overwhelmed with grief, forgetting even why I was angry. Days became increasingly difficult, and the desire to express my thoughts grew stronger. It led to frequent outbursts, sometimes occurring every hour. My parents were deeply concerned but helpless. There were no schools for the deaf and blind near our town of Tuscumbia, and very few people were willing to come to such a remote place to teach a child who was blind, deaf, and mute. At that time, everyone doubted whether someone like me could receive an education. However, my mother found a glimmer of hope while reading Dickens' American Notes, where he mentioned a deaf, blind, and mute girl named Laura who had achieved success through the teaching methods of Dr. Howe. But when my mother learned that Dr. Howe, who invented the educational methods for the blind and deaf, had passed away years ago, and his methods might have been lost, she became deeply troubled. Were there any successors to Dr. Howe? And if there were, would they be willing to come to this remote town in Alabama to teach me? At the age of six, my father heard about a renowned eye doctor in Baltimore who had cured several blind people. My parents immediately decided to take me there for treatment. It was a delightful journey, one that I still vividly remember. I made many friends on the train. A woman gave me a box of seashells, and my father pierced holes in them for me to thread with a string. For a long time, those seashells brought me endless joy and satisfaction. The conductor was kind and friendly, allowing me to hold onto his coat whenever he came to check or punch tickets. He even let me play with his ticket-punching scissors, and I would sit in a corner of the seat, happily punching holes in some scraps of paper for hours on end. My aunt made a large doll for me out of a towel, but it had no eyes, ears, mouth, or nose. Even with a child's imagination, I couldn't picture what the face looked like. The absence of eyes was a huge blow to me, and I insisted that everyone find a solution. But ultimately, no one could add eyes to the cloth doll. Then, a sudden idea struck me. I slipped out of my seat and found my aunt's shawl, adorned with large beads. I pulled off two of them and showed them to my aunt, indicating that she should sew them onto the doll's face. She took my hand and guided it to touch her own eyes, confirming my intention. I nodded vigorously. She sewed on the beads, and I was thrilled. However, it didn't take long for me to lose interest in the cloth doll. Throughout the entire journey, there were countless things that captured my attention. I was busy and content, without a single temper tantrum. Upon arriving in Baltimore, we went directly to Dr. Chisholm's clinic, where the doctor warmly received us. After the examination, he admitted his inability to help, but he encouraged us, saying that I could receive an education and suggested that my father take me to Washington to find Alexander Graham Bell. 
He said that Dr. Bell might provide us with information about schools for the deaf and blind, as well as qualified teachers. Following Dr. Chisholm's advice, our entire family immediately set off for Washington. Along the way, my parents were filled with worry and concern, while I, oblivious to it all, felt nothing but excitement, as if embarking on a delightful journey. During that time, though I was still an ignorant child, I could sense the warmth and enthusiasm in my interactions with Dr. Bell. He would hold me on his lap and let me play with his watch. He made the watch tick, allowing me to feel its vibrations. With his remarkable medical skills and understanding of my gestures, I immediately took a liking to him. Little did I realize at the time that this encounter would become a turning point in my life, opening the doors from darkness to light, from solitude to warmth, and granting me the key to knowledge. Dr. Bell suggested that my father write a letter to Mr. Anagnos, the principal of Perkins School for the Blind in Boston, asking him to find a tutor for me. Perkins School was the place mentioned in Dickens' American Notes, where Dr. Howe tirelessly worked for the deaf, blind, and mute individuals. My father promptly sent the letter. After a few weeks, we received an enthusiastic reply, bringing us delight. 7. Understanding the meaning of love. Now, I have acquired the key to language and I am eager to apply it. Usually, children with hearing abilities can effortlessly learn a language. They can easily comprehend and learn what others say and mimic their speech with joy. However, deaf children have to endure countless pains and hardships before they can learn. But no matter how arduous the journey, the outcome is always incredibly beautiful. I gradually started learning from the names of everything, from pronouncing them syllabically, and progressed to envisioning boundless beauty in Shakespeare's sonnets. Initially, the teacher told me many new things, and I rarely asked questions. Due to my limited knowledge and vague concepts, I had a limited grasp of words. As my understanding of the world gradually increased, so did my vocabulary, and with it, more questions arose. I often delved into the details of things, wanting to learn more and understand them better. Sometimes, from a new word I was learning, I would often associate it with past experiences. I remember one morning when I asked for the meaning of the word, love. At that time, my knowledge of words was still limited. I picked a few early blooming violets from the garden and gave them to Miss Sullivan. She wanted to kiss me with joy, but back then, besides my mother, I didn't want anyone else to kiss me. At that moment, Miss Sullivan gently embraced me with one arm and spelled out the words, I love Helen, on my hand. What is love? I asked. Miss Sullivan hugged me tighter and pointed to my heart, saying, love is here. It was the first time I felt my heart beating, but I was still confused by her words and actions because at that time, I understood very little apart from things I could touch. I smelled the violets in her hand and asked with a combination of words and gestures, is love the fragrance of flowers? No, Miss Sullivan said. I pondered again. The sun was warmly shining upon us. Is love the sun? I pointed in the direction of the sunlight and asked, is it the sun? At that time, in my eyes, there was nothing better than the sun. Its warmth made everything flourish. But Miss Sullivan shook her head repeatedly, and I felt both puzzled and disappointed, wondering why she couldn't tell me what love was. A day or two later, I was stringing beads of different sizes together, following a pattern of two big ones and three small ones. I kept making mistakes, and Miss Sullivan patiently corrected me. Towards the end, I realized that a big section was wrong. So, I pondered in my heart, trying to figure out how to string the beads correctly. 
Miss Sullivan touched my forehead and vigorously spelled out the word, think. Suddenly, I understood that the word referred to the process taking place in the mind. It was the first time I grasped an abstract concept. I sat quietly for a long time, not thinking about the arrangement of the beads, but seeking an understanding of love with new concepts in my mind. That day, dark clouds filled the sky, and intermittent drizzles fell, but suddenly, the sun broke through the clouds, radiating dazzling light. I asked Miss Sullivan again, is love like the sun? Love is a bit like the clouds in the sky before the sun comes out, Miss Sullivan answered. She seemed to realize that I was still perplexed, so she explained with simpler words that I still couldn't comprehend at the time, you can't touch the clouds, but you can feel the rain. You also know how happy the flowers and the earth would be to receive rain after a scorching day. Love is intangible, yet you can sense the sweetness it brings. Without love, joy dissipates, and the desire to play fades away. In an instant, I comprehended the essence of her words. I felt countless invisible threads weaving between my soul and others. From the very beginning, Miss Sullivan treated me just like any other hearing and sighted child, with one exception, she spelled out each sentence on my hand instead of speaking. If I couldn't understand the words or expressions used to convey thoughts, she would gently remind me. And when I struggled to communicate with others, she would promptly provide guidance. This learning process continued for many years. A deaf child cannot possibly master even the simplest everyday language within a few months or even years, let alone use it immediately and flexibly. Normal children learn to speak through constant repetition and imitation. They listen to adults speaking at home, their minds actively processing and associating with the content of the conversation, and they learn to express their thoughts. However, a deaf child cannot naturally communicate their thoughts. Miss Sullivan recognized this and employed various methods to compensate for my shortcomings. She tirelessly and meticulously repeated everyday phrases, word by word, teaching me how to engage in conversation. But it took a long time before I gathered the courage to initiate conversations with others, and an even longer time to learn what to say in different situations burning desire for knowledge within me. Ah, I discovered that every object in the universe has its own name, and each name can inspire new thoughts within me. I began to view everything with a sense of novelty. Upon returning to the house, every object I encountered seemed to come alive. I remembered the doll I had broken, and I fumbled my way to the stove, picking up the fragments, hoping to piece them back together. But no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't fix it. Reminded of my earlier actions, I felt deep remorse, and tears welled up in my eyes. It was the first time in my life. On that day, I learned many words such as, father, mother, sister, and teacher. These words transformed the world before me into a colorful tapestry, brimming with beauty. I recall that wonderful night, lying alone in bed, my heart filled with joy, eagerly anticipating the arrival of a new day. Ah, is there any child in the world happier than I am? Section 6. Embracing Nature. In March 1887, Miss Sullivan entered my life and opened the eyes of my soul within the walls of the well house. The memories of that time remain vivid in my mind. I spent my days exploring objects with my hands, learning their names, and understanding their uses. The more objects I touched and familiarized myself with, the happier and more confident I became, feeling a stronger connection to the outside world. As the vibrant summer arrived, Miss Sullivan took me by the hand and strolled along the banks of the Tennessee River. 
We gazed upon the fields and hills, observing people sowing seeds in the fields. We sat down on the soft grass by the river and embarked on a new journey of life. It was here that I began to comprehend the blessings bestowed upon humanity by nature. I understood how sunlight and rain nourished the growth of trees on the Earth's surface. I learned about birds and their nesting habits, their reproduction, and their seasonal migrations. I also discovered how squirrels, deer, lions, and various other animals foraged for food and found shelter. The more I learned, the more I appreciated the greatness of nature and the beauty of the world. Miss Sullivan first taught me to appreciate beauty by touching the sturdy trees, delicate grass blades, and even the tiny hands of my sister. Then she taught me to draw the shape of the earth. She connected my enlightenment with nature, making me a joyful companion of flowers and birds. However, during this time, something occurred that made me realize nature was not always benevolent. It was a clear morning when my teacher and I took a walk to a distant place. But as we began our journey back home, the weather turned oppressively hot. We had to rest several times under the shade of trees by the roadside. Our final respite was beneath a wild cherry tree not far from home. The branches of the tree were lush and inviting to climb. Miss Sullivan gave me a boost, and I ascended into the tree, finding a comfortable spot on a sturdy branch. The tree provided a cool and refreshing sanctuary. Excitedly, Miss Sullivan suggested we have our lunch there. Delighted, I promised to sit quietly and wait for her to bring the food. Suddenly, the weather changed dramatically. The warmth of the sun vanished, replaced by dark clouds filling the sky. A peculiar scent emanated from the earth. I knew this was the usual sign before a storm. I felt an indescribable fear, a sense of loneliness and separation from loved ones and the earth itself. I sat motionless, clutching the tree trunk, trembling with each gust of wind, anxiously awaiting Miss Sullivan's return. After a period of silence, the leaves rustled violently, and it seemed as though the strong wind intended to uproot the tree. I clung to the branches, fearing I would be blown away. The tree shook more intensely, and falling leaves and broken twigs rained down upon me. Despite my desire to escape from the tree, I dared not move. I felt the earth quiver beneath me, as if something heavy had crashed to the ground, the vibrations reaching the branch on which I sat. Overwhelmed by terror, just as I was about to scream, Miss Sullivan arrived. She grabbed hold of my hand and helped me down. I held her tightly, overjoyed to be in contact with the solid ground once again. I gained a new understanding, nature sometimes wages war on her children, concealing sharp claws beneath her gentle and beautiful exterior. After that harrowing experience, I refrained from climbing trees for a long time. The very thought of it made me tremble with fear. Until one day, unable to resist the irresistible temptation of the blooming and fragrant mimosa tree, I overcame my fear. It was a beautiful morning in spring. I sat alone in the gazebo, engrossed in a book, when a faint fragrance wafted through the air, as if the spirit of spring was passing by. I could distinguish it as the scent of the mimosa tree. Intrigued, I decided to go and explore. I made my way to the end of the garden, where the mimosa tree stood at the bend of a path along the hedge. Under the warm sunlight, the blossoms of the mimosa tree danced in the rays, with branches laden with flowers almost brushing against the green grass. Those beautiful flowers would cascade down with the slightest touch. I passed through the swirling petals and approached the majestic tree. Standing there for a moment, I then extended my foot to find a vacant spot among the branches, 
and with both hands gripping the trunk, I began to climb upward. The trunk was thick, and my grip was not firm, causing the bark to scrape my hands, but I had a wondrous feeling. I was doing something extraordinary. Encouraged, I continued climbing higher, until I reached a comfortable seat. It was a small chair that someone had made long ago, now fused with the tree over time. I sat there for a long time, feeling as if I were a fairy soaring through the sky. Since that day, I often indulged in play, contemplation, and wandered through delightful dreams on this celestial mimosa tree. Ate the joy and wonder the second phase of my education was learning to read once I could spell a few words with letters. Miss Sally would give me some stiff cards with raised letters on them. I quickly learned that each raised letter represented an object in action or a characteristic. I had a frame where I could arrange short sentences with the words I had learned but before arranging the sentences with these stiff cards. I was accustomed to using real objects to express the sentences for example. 9. Christmas Miss Sally's first Christmas in Tascambia became an unprecedented event for me. Everyone in the family was preparing unexpected gifts for me, and even more exciting was that Miss Sally and I were also preparing surprise gifts for others. I was overjoyed, wondering what gifts people would give me. Family members tried various ways to tease me, intentionally dropping subtle hints or incomplete sentences to make me guess. Miss Sally and I played this guessing game, and I learned more word usage than I did in class. Every night, we sat around the warm fireplace playing the guessing game all night long. As Christmas approached, our excitement grew. On Christmas Eve, the students in town invited me to celebrate the holiday with them. There was a beautiful Christmas tree in the classroom, adorned with fascinating fruits that shimmered under soft lights. It was a moment of utmost happiness, and I couldn't contain my excitement as I danced and jumped around the Christmas tree. When I learned that every child could receive a gift, I was overjoyed. Those kind-hearted people allowed me to distribute the gifts. I was so busy that I didn't even have time to look at my own gift. I couldn't wait for Christmas to arrive because I knew those gifts were not what my family had hinted at. Miss Sally said that those gifts would be much better. But she told me to be patient and that I would find out what they were in the morning. That night, on Christmas Eve, I hung up my stockings and lay in bed, but I couldn't fall asleep for a long time. I wanted to see when Santa Claus would come and what he would do. Eventually, I became so tired that I fell asleep, holding the new doll and teddy bear I had received that night. The next morning, I woke up earlier than anyone else, and my cheerful, Merry Christmas, woke up the whole family. Not only did I find unexpected gifts in my stockings, but also on the table, chairs, and even on the doorstep and every windowsill. Almost every step I took, I encountered a surprising Christmas gift. And when Miss Sally gave me a canary, I was ecstatic beyond words. I named the canary, Tim. Little Tim was agile and gentle, often hopping around on my fingers and eating the red cherries I fed it by hand. Miss Sally taught me how to take care of little Tim. After finishing breakfast every morning, I would give it a bath, clean the cage thoroughly, fill its little cup with fresh grass seeds and water from the well, and then hang a small bundle of dandelion leaves on its perch. One morning, I placed the birdcage on the windowsill and went to fetch water for its bath. When I returned and opened the door, I felt a large cat darting out from under my feet. At first, I didn't pay much attention, but when I reached my hand into the cage and felt no trace of Tim's wings or its little sharp beak, I knew deep down that I would never see my lovely little songbird again. 
10. Trip to Boston. The second major event of my life was the trip to Boston in May 1888. From the preparations before departure to the journey with my teacher and mother, everything I saw and experienced along the way, and the various situations upon arriving in Boston, it all remains vivid in my memory as if it happened yesterday. This trip was completely different from my visit to Baltimore two years ago. I was no longer the mischievous little troublemaker who was easily excited and couldn't sit still in the car. I sat quietly beside Miss Sally, attentively listening to her descriptions of everything outside the window, the beautiful Tennessee River, endless cotton fields, distant rolling hills, verdant forests, and the black people who flocked to the train selling sweet candies and popcorn. Facing me was Nancy, a large and worn-out cloth doll. I dressed her in a new outfit made of checkered fabric and put a crumpled sun hat on her head. Her glass bead eyes stared fixedly at me. Sometimes, when the teacher's storytelling wasn't as captivating, I would think of Nancy and hold her in my arms, though I usually believed she was fast asleep. After this, I probably won't have a chance to mention Nancy again. When she arrived in Boston, she was a pitiful sight, covered in mud, perhaps because I forced her to eat crumbs on the train, and she refused, but I insisted, resulting in a muddy mess. The laundry worker at Perkins School for the Blind, seeing how dirty the doll was, secretly washed her. But my poor Nancy couldn't withstand being washed with water. By the time I saw her again, she had turned into a pile of disheveled cotton. If it weren't for her two bead eyes glaring at me with resentment, I wouldn't have recognized her at all. Finally, the train arrived at the station, and we arrived in Boston, as if a beautiful fairy tale had become a reality. Only, once upon a time, turned into now, and, a faraway place, became, right before my eyes. As soon as I arrived at Perkins School for the Blind, I made friends with the blind children there. I was thrilled to learn that they could communicate using sign language. Finally, I could converse with other children in my own language. How could I not be overjoyed? Before this, I felt like a foreigner, always needing a translator to speak with others. But here, at Perkins School for the Blind, the children all spoke Dr. Howe's invented sign language, and it felt like I had returned to my own country. After a few days, I discovered that my new friends were all blind too. I knew I couldn't see, but I had never realized that those lively and lovely playmates who jumped and danced around me were also unable to see. I still remember how astonished and pained I felt when I noticed them placing their hands on mine to talk and using their fingers to read. Although they had told me before, and I knew about my own physical limitations, I had always vaguely believed that since they could hear, there must be some kind of second sight. I never imagined that one child after another was just like me, completely unable to see. But they were so happy, so lively. Immersed in their joyful atmosphere, I quickly forgot my pain. Being with the blind children in Boston made me feel like I was at home. The days flew by, and every day I eagerly sought new experiences. I regarded Boston as the beginning of the world, and also its end. I could hardly believe that there was a wider world beyond this. During our time in Boston, we visited Beacon Hill, where Miss Sally gave me my first history lesson. When I learned that the mountain before me was the very place where heroes had fought years ago, I was filled with tremendous excitement. Counting each step as I climbed higher and higher, I imagined the brave heroes scaling the heights, taking aim from above, and shooting at the enemy. The next day, we embarked on a boat to Plymouth. It was my first voyage at sea and my first time aboard a ship. 
Life at sea was truly vibrant and bustling. However, the rumbling sound of the engines made me feel like thunder was approaching. Worried that it might rain and ruin our outdoor picnic, I became anxious and even shed tears. What fascinated me the most about Plymouth was the large rock that the early settlers had stepped upon when they first landed. Touching that rock with my hands, I felt as if I were witnessing the arduous journey of those settlers come to life before my eyes. During our visit to the Immigration Museum, a kind and friendly gentleman gifted me a model of the Plymouth Rock. I often held it in my hands, feeling the uneven surface, the crack in the middle, and the engraving of 1620. It evoked images of the remarkable and inspiring deeds of the early British immigrants in my mind. Oh, how noble and great their achievements were in my young heart. They were the bravest and most generous individuals who created a home in a foreign land, not only securing their own freedom but also fighting for the freedom of their fellow countrymen. However, several years later, when I learned about their religious persecutions, it deeply surprised and disappointed me. In Boston, I made many new friends, among them William and Mr. Wade and his daughter. Their kindness and warmth are unforgettable. One day, we visited their farm in Beverly. As we strolled through the beautiful rose garden, two dogs ran up to greet us. The larger one was named Leon, while the smaller one had curly fur and long ears, called Fritz. The farm was home to many horses, and the fastest one was named Nimrod. It nudged its nose into my hand, urging me to pat it and offer it a piece of candy. These moments left me with cherished memories. I still remember that the farm was situated near the seaside, and it was my first time playing on the sandy beach. The sand was firm and smooth, unlike the soft and sharp mixture of grass and shells on the Brewster shoreline. Mr. Wade informed me that many large steamships departing from Boston to Europe passed by that area. I encountered him several times afterward, and he was always kind and amiable. In all honesty, the reason I refer to Boston as the City of Good Hearts is because of him. 11. Embracing the Ocean Before Perkins School closed for summer vacation, Miss Sally Van and Mrs. Hobbs, a dear friend, had already arranged for us to go on a vacation together at Brewster Beach in Cape Cod. I was filled with extreme excitement, envisioning the joyful days ahead and the various magical and fascinating stories about the sea. That summer vacation, the most memorable experience for me was the ocean. I had never had the opportunity to get close to the sea or even taste the saltiness of seawater. However, I had once read a passage about the sea in a thick book called, Our World. It sparked my curiosity and a longing to touch the vast ocean, to feel the surging and tumultuous waves. When I learned that my long-cherished wish was about to come true, my little heart raced with excitement. As they helped me change into my swimsuit, I couldn't wait to run on the warm beach and eagerly jumped into the icy cold water. I felt the impact and buoyancy of the huge waves, which filled me with a trembling joy. Suddenly, my foot accidentally hit a rock, and the next moment, a wave crashed onto my head. I reached out my hands, desperately trying to grasp onto something, but all I could feel was the seawater and some seaweed tangling on my face. No matter how hard I struggled, it was all in vain. The waves seemed to be playing with me, tossing me around and leaving me dizzy and disoriented. It was truly terrifying. There was no vast and solid land beneath my feet anymore. Apart from the unfamiliar waves rushing at me from all sides, it seemed like everything in the world ceased to exist. There was no life, no air, no warmth, no love. 
Finally, the ocean seemed to grow tired of me as its new plaything and finally washed us ashore. Miss Sally Van immediately embraced me tightly in her arms. Oh, what a friendly and warm embrace it was. After recovering from my fear, the first words that came out of my mouth were, who put salt in the seawater? With my first encounter with seawater, I experienced the power of the ocean. Since then, I dared not venture into the sea anymore. Instead, I loved sitting on the large rocks wearing my swimsuit, feeling the waves crashing against the rocks, splashing up like a sudden downpour, rushing towards me. I could sense the ferocity of the waves relentlessly pounding the shore, the pebbles rolling, and the raging waves seemingly shaking the entire beach, with the air trembling along with the waves. The waves would break upon the rocks, recede, and then gather again, unleashing even more forceful impact. I clung motionless to the rocks, allowing the angry sea to assault and roar. I cherished the coast so much. It is a pure and fresh scent that made me alert and calm. Shells, pebbles, seaweed, and the small creatures within the seaweed all had an endless allure to me. One day, Miss Sally Van caught a peculiar sunbathing creature in the shallow water near the shore. It was a large horseshoe crab, and I had never seen anything like it before. Curiously, I reached out to touch it. How did it manage to carry its house on its back? Suddenly, an idea struck me. It would be wonderful to take it back home and keep it as a pet, so I grabbed hold of it and began dragging it back. The horseshoe crab was quite heavy, and it took an enormous effort to drag it along the ground for a mile and a half. Upon returning home, I insisted to Miss Sally Van that we put it in a tank near the well, thinking it would be a safe place. However, to my surprise, when I checked the tank the next morning, the crab was gone. No one knew where it had run off to, nor did anyone know how it managed to escape. I was initially frustrated and annoyed, but gradually, I realized that confining that poor, speechless creature here was neither compassionate nor wise. After some time, I began to believe that it had probably returned to the ocean, and my mood became joyful once again. 12. Autumn in the Mountains in the autumn of that year, laden with beautiful memories, I returned to my hometown in the south. Whenever I reminisce about my journey to the north, my heart fills with joy. This trip seemed to mark the beginning of a new life for me. The fresh and beautiful world laid all its treasures at my feet, allowing me to eagerly gather new knowledge. I immersed myself fully in experiencing all the wonders of the world, never idle for a moment. My life was brimming with vitality, like those insects that are born in the morning and die at night, compressing a lifetime into a single day. I met many people who communicated with me through written words in my hands, and our thoughts were filled with shared happiness. Wasn't this a miracle? The wilderness that once existed between my heart and the hearts of others had now bloomed with colorful flowers and vibrant vegetation. That autumn, my family and I spent time on a mountain about 14 miles away from Tuscumbia. On the mountain stood a small summer villa called Fragmite Stone Mine, named after an abandoned limestone quarry nearby. The tall rocks were adorned with numerous springs that converged into three small rivers, meandering and cascading down whenever they encountered obstacles, forming charming little waterfalls, like smiling faces welcoming guests. The open spaces were covered with fragmites, concealing the limestone completely and even obscuring the small rivers at times. The mountain was dense with trees, including towering oak trees and lush evergreens. The trunks resembled moss-covered stone pillars, and the branches were adorned with ivy and parasitic plants. 
The fragrance of persimmon trees permeated every corner of the forest, refreshing and enchanting. In some places, wild grapes climbed from one tree to another, forming pergolas made of vines, where colorful butterflies and busy bees fluttered ceaselessly. In the evening, within this lush greenery deep in the forest, a refreshing and pleasant fragrance wafted through the air, intoxicating and uplifting the spirit. Our villa was nestled amidst groves of oak and pine trees at the mountaintop. Although it was modest, the surroundings were picturesque. The house was small, divided into two rows with a long, uncovered corridor in the middle. There was a wide veranda surrounding the house, and whenever the wind blew, it carried the fragrant scent emanating from the trees. We spent most of our time on the veranda, studying, dining, and playing games. Next to the back door stood a tall and large walnut tree, with stone steps surrounding it. There were many other trees in front of the house, and from the veranda, I could reach out and touch their trunks, feeling the branches sway and the leaves gently fall. Many people frequently visited us here. In the evenings, the men played cards, chatted, and engaged in games near the bonfire. They boasted about their exceptional skills in hunting wild birds and catching fish, tirelessly describing the number of wild ducks and turkeys they had shot, the ferocious salmon they had caught, the cunning foxes they had trapped with pockets, the agile squirrels they had captured with cunning, and the swiftly running deer they had unexpectedly caught. They narrated their stories vividly and impressively. In the presence of these resourceful hunters, it seemed that there was no place left for even the most cunning predators. Finally, as the mesmerized listeners dispersed to sleep, the storytellers bid everyone good night with the usual phrase, see you again on the hunting grounds tomorrow. They slept on makeshift tents set up outside our house on the veranda. From inside the house, I could even hear the barking of hunting dogs and the snoring of the hunters. At dawn, I would be awakened by the aroma of coffee, the sound of hunting rifles, and the footsteps of the hunters as they prepared to depart. I could also sense the sound of horse hooves. These horses were ridden by the hunters, who had ridden them all the way from the town and tied them to trees overnight, their neighs echoing urgently, eager to break free from their ropes and follow their masters on the journey. Finally, one by one, the hunters mounted their horses, just as the folk song goes, the steeds gallop, reins jingle and whips crack, hunting dogs leading the way, hunters, set forth. At noon, we started preparing lunch. A deep pit was dug in the ground, and a fire was lit inside. Thick, long branches were used as skewers to roast meat, threaded onto them with iron wires. Dark-skinned servants squatted around the fire, waving long branches to drive away flies. The aroma of the grilled meat wafted through the air, and before the table was set, my stomach would already growl hungrily. Just as we were joyfully preparing for the picnic, the hunters returned in small groups. They were exhausted, with froth coming out of their horses' mouths, and the hunting dogs panting heavily, their tongues hanging out. They were asked about their harvest, but they hadn't caught anything at all. During that summer, I raised a small horse of my own on the mountain. I named her, Black Beauty, after a book I had just finished reading. This horse resembled the one in the book, especially with its shiny black coat and the white star on its forehead, which were identical. I spent many joyful hours riding on its back. When the horse was gentle, Miss Sally would loosen the reins and let it roam freely. Sometimes, the horse would stop by the side of the trail to graze on grass, and other times it would nibble on leaves from small trees. In the mornings when I didn't feel like riding, after breakfast, I would take a stroll in the woods with Miss Sally. 
On a whim, I would intentionally get lost between the trees and grapevines, only following the narrow paths created by cows and horses. If we encountered bushes blocking our way, we would detour around them. Upon returning, we would always bring back several large bunches of southern flowers such as osmanthus, autumn chrysanthemums, and pampas grass. Sometimes, I would go with Mary and her cousins to pick persimmons. I didn't particularly enjoy eating persimmons, but I loved their fragrance and the thrill of searching for them in the grass and piles of leaves. We would also gather various mountain fruits, and I would help them peel chestnuts and crack the hard shells of walnuts and hazelnuts. The walnut kernels were large and sweet. At the foot of the mountain, there was a railway track where trains would speed past us. Sometimes, the train would let out a long, mournful whistle, scaring us into running back to the house. However, my sister would nervously and excitedly come to tell me if she spotted a cow or a horse walking on the railway track, completely unaffected by the sharp sound of the train whistle. About a mile away from the villa, there was a high bridge spanning a deep gorge. The distance between the sleepers was quite large, and walking on the bridge made us feel as if we were treading on the edge of a knife. I had never thought of crossing that bridge until one day when Miss Sally, my sister, and I got lost in the woods for hours without finding a way back. Suddenly, my sister pointed ahead with her finger and shouted loudly, High bridge, high bridge. In truth, we would rather have taken any other difficult path than cross that bridge. Unfortunately, darkness was approaching, and this shortcut was the only option in front of us. Reluctantly, I tiptoed forward, testing the sleepers. At first, I wasn't too afraid, and my steps were steady. But suddenly, faint, thud, thud, sounds came from a distance. The train is coming, my sister shouted. If we hadn't immediately crouched down between the crossbeams, we could have been crushed. It was a close call. The hot air from the train blew against my face, and the coal smoke and ashes choked us almost to the point of suffocation. The train raced past, shaking the high bridge incessantly, making us feel as if we were about to be thrown into the abyss. It took all our strength to climb back up. When we returned home, night had already fallen, and there was no one in the house. They had all gone out searching for us. 13. The Pure White World After my trip to Boston, I spent almost every winter in the northern regions. One time, I decided to spend the winter in a small village in New England. There, I witnessed frozen lakes and vast snow-covered plains. It was my first glimpse into the infinite mysteries of the icy world. I was amazed to see how nature's whimsical hand stripped away the outer garments of trees and forests, leaving only scattered remnants of withered leaves. The birds had flown away, and the bare trees stood with snow-filled nests. Towering mountains and expansive plains presented a desolate scene. The frosty touch of the winter god had turned the earth numb, and the spirits of the trees had retreated to their roots. Everything seemed to have vanished, curled up and slumbering in the dark underground. Even when the sun shone brightly, the daytime remained contracted and cold, as if its veins had withered and aged. It weakly rose, just to cast a hazy glance at this frozen world. One day, the weather turned gloomy, foreshadowing an impending blizzard. Before long, snowflakes began to fall. We rushed outside, trying to catch the earliest snowflakes in our hands. Silently and gracefully, the snowflakes descended from the sky, persistently falling for several hours. The plains transformed into a smooth, vast expanse of white. When we woke up early in the morning, we could hardly recognize the original appearance of the village. 
The roads were covered in snow, with no discernible signs to mark the way, except for bare trees standing in the snow. In the evening, a sudden northeasterly wind arose, swirling the accumulated snow and causing the snowflakes to dance in the air. Gathered around a roaring fireplace, my family told stories and played games, completely forgetting our isolated solitude. During the night, the wind grew stronger, and the snowfall intensified. We were filled with fear. The eaves creaked, and the trees outside swayed back and forth. Broken branches incessantly struck the windows, producing dreadful sounds. It wasn't until the third day that the heavy snow finally ceased. The sun peeked through the clouds, illuminating the vast white undulating plains. Everywhere, peculiar snow mounds had formed from the accumulated snow. We cleared a narrow path in the snow, and I stepped out wearing a hood and cloak. The air was bitterly cold, stinging my cheeks with every gust of wind. Along with my teacher, Sally, we alternated between walking on the path and trudging through the snow, one foot deep and the other shallow. We arrived at a pine forest, beyond which lay a wide open meadow. The pine trees stood in the snow, adorned in silver, resembling marble sculptures. Their fragrant pine needles were absent. Sunlight glistened on the tree branches, sparkling like diamonds. With a gentle touch, the snow fell from the branches like raindrops. The intense sunlight reflected off the snowy ground, penetrating the darkness that veiled my eyes. The snow slowly melted, but before it could completely disappear, another blizzard arrived. Throughout the winter, it was rare to step on solid ground. The icicles on the trees occasionally melted, but they quickly donned the same white attire again. Reeds and tufts of grass turned yellow, and the sunbathed surface of the lake froze and hardened. That winter, our favorite pastime was sledding. There were steep sections along the lake shore, and we slid down from the steepest slopes. We all sat on the sled, and with a powerful push from one of the children, the sled rushed downward. Through the snow, over the hollows, straight towards the lake below, we swiftly crossed the shimmering surface, gliding to the other side. It was incredibly fun. What an enjoyable game. In that moment of exhilarating speed, it felt as if we had disconnected from the world, racing with the wind, experiencing a blissful and ethereal sensation. In the spring of 1890, I began to learn how to speak. I had a strong urge to produce sounds from a very young age. I often placed one hand on my throat and the other on my lips, trying to make sounds. I had a keen interest in any sound I heard. When I heard a cat meow or a dog bark, I loved touching their mouths with my hands. When someone sang, I enjoyed feeling their throat with my hands, and when someone played the piano, I loved touching the keys. Learning to speak was quick before I lost my hearing and vision. However, since falling ill and losing my ability to hear, I couldn't speak anymore. I would sit on my mother's lap all day, placing my hands on her face to feel the movement of her lips, finding it amusing. Although I had long forgotten what speaking was all about, I imitated others by moving my own lips. My family said that my crying and laughter sounded natural. Sometimes, I could still make sounds from my mouth, spelling out one or two words. But it wasn't for the purpose of talking to others, it was an involuntary exercise of my articulatory organs. There was only one word that I could still remember after falling ill, and that was, water. I often pronounced it as, wa, wa. Slowly, I started to forget its meaning until Miss Sullivan came to teach me. After learning to spell the word with my fingers, I stopped making that sound. I had long known that people around me communicated in different ways. 
Even before I learned that deaf people could also learn to speak, I was already dissatisfied with my own method of communication. Relying solely on sign language to communicate with others always made me feel restrained and limited. This feeling became increasingly unbearable, and I yearned to break free from these constraints. I would often get frustrated, fluttering my lips like a bird flapping its wings, desperately wanting to speak with my mouth. My family tried to prevent me from speaking with my mouth, fearing that I would become discouraged if I couldn't learn it well. But I never lost heart. Later, hearing the story of Laura Bridgman by chance further strengthened my confidence in learning to speak. In 1890, Mrs. Lamson, who had taught Laura before, returned from a visit to Norway and Sweden and came to visit me. She told me about a blind and deaf girl in Norway named Laura Bridgman, who had learned to speak. Before she could finish her story, I was already impatient and secretly determined to learn how to speak. I insisted that Miss Sullivan take me to Boston to find Miss Sarah Fuller, the principal of the Horace Mann School, and asked her to help and teach me. This kind-hearted lady agreed to personally teach me. So, starting from March 26, 1890, we began our lessons with her. The method Miss Fuller taught me was to place my hand gently on her face when she pronounced words, allowing me to feel the movement of her tongue and lips. I diligently imitated every action she made, and within an hour, I learned to say the letters M, P, A, S, and T with my mouth. In total, Miss Fuller gave me 11 lessons. I will never forget the sheer joy I felt when I spoke the sentence, the weather is warm, fluently for the first time. Even though they were only a few intermittent syllables, they were, after all, the language of human beings. I realized there was a new power that freed me from the shackles of my soul. With these fragmented linguistic symbols, I could acquire complete knowledge and gain belief. If a child who is deaf is eager to speak words they have never heard before, to escape the silent world of death, devoid of love, warmth, the chirping of insects, the singing of birds, and the beauty of music, they will never forget the overwhelming excitement that courses through their entire body when they utter their first word. Only such a person knows how eagerly I played with toys, rocks, trees, birds, and even non-speaking animals, as they spoke. Only such a person knows the immense joy I felt when my sister understood my greetings and the little dogs obeyed my commands. Nowadays, I can speak with the wings of words, and I no longer need someone to translate for me. The convenience I have gained from this cannot be described in words. I can now think and speak simultaneously, which was impossible before when I relied on finger spelling. However, do not think that within this short period, I have truly mastered speech. I have only learned some basic principles of speaking, and only Miss Fuller and Miss Sullivan can understand my meaning while others can comprehend only a small part. After acquiring these basic sounds, if it weren't for Miss Sullivan's genius and her unwavering efforts, I would not have been able to learn natural language at such a rapid pace. At first, I practiced tirelessly day and night to make my closest friends understand me. Then, with the help of Miss Sullivan, I practiced and practiced to pronounce each word accurately and to combine different sounds freely. Even now, she corrects my incorrect pronunciation every day. Only those who have taught deaf-mute children to speak can understand what this means and the difficulties I must overcome. I rely entirely on my fingers to sense Miss Sullivan's lips. I use touch to grasp the vibration of her throat the movement of her mouth, and the expression on her face, but it is often inaccurate.
In such situations, I force myself to repeatedly practice words and sentences that I struggle to pronounce, sometimes for hours, until I feel that the sound I produce is accurate. My task is to practice, practice, and practice again. Failure and fatigue often trip me up, but the thought that a little more perseverance will make my pronunciation accurate and allow my loved ones to see my progress gives me courage. I am eager to see them smile at my success. My sister will soon understand my words. This has become the strong belief that inspires me to overcome all difficulties. I often repeat with ecstatic joy, I am no longer dumb. The confidence within me swells at the realization that I will be able to converse freely with my mother, understanding her reactions through her lips. I was amazed to discover that speaking with the mouth is much easier than speaking with fingers. As a result, I no longer use manual alphabet to communicate with people. However, Miss Sullivan and some friends still communicate with me using this method because sign language letters are more convenient and I understand them more quickly compared to lip reading. Here, I should perhaps explain the manual alphabet used by the deaf-blind. Those who are unfamiliar with our methods seem to be somewhat confused by sign language. When people read to me or have conversations with me, they use the general method used by the deaf, spelling out words and sentences on my hand with one hand. I gently place my hand on the speaker's hand, not hindering their finger movements, while easily feeling the motion of their fingers. My sensation is similar to people reading a book, perceiving words as a whole, rather than individual letters. People who converse with me, because their fingers move frequently, are adept and agile in using their fingers. Some individuals spell letters so quickly, just like a skilled typist on a typewriter. Of course, proficient spelling becomes an unconscious action for me, similar to writing. After I could speak with my mouth, I couldn't wait to return home. This crucial moment had finally arrived, and I embarked on the journey back. Along the way, Miss Sullivan and I kept talking with our mouths. I didn't speak just for the sake of speaking, rather, I seized every opportunity to improve my speaking ability. Unbeknownst to us, the train had already arrived at the station, and we saw my family standing on the platform, welcoming us. As I stepped off the train, my mother immediately embraced me, trembling all over, too excited to utter a word, silently and eagerly listening to every sound I made. Little sister Mildred grabbed my hand, showering it with kisses and affection, joyfully jumping up and down. Father stood by silently, but his benevolent face revealed extreme delight. Even now, whenever I think of that scene, tears well up in my eyes, as if the prophecy of Isaiah had come true in me. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. 15. The Frost King Incident In the winter of 1892, a dark cloud enveloped my childhood. I was melancholic, immersed in pain, worry, and fear for a long time. Even now, the memory of those dreadful days sends shivers down my spine. I wrote a short story titled, The Frost King, and sent it to Mr. Anagnos, the director of the Perkins Institution for the Blind, unaware of the trouble it would cause. To clarify the matter, I had to reveal the truth and seek justice for myself and Miss Sullivan. It was the first story I wrote after learning to speak. During the summer, while staying at our mountain villa for a longer period than usual, Miss Sullivan often described the beauty of tree leaves in different seasons. It reminded me of a story I had heard before, and without realizing it, I remembered it. I believed I was creating a story, and eagerly wanted to write it down before forgetting. 
My thoughts gushed forth, and I immersed myself completely in the joy of writing. Fluent language and vivid imagery flowed from my pen onto the braille paper used by the blind. Now, if any ideas effortlessly enter my mind, I can confidently say they are not my own creations but something I picked up from others. However, at that time, it was difficult for me to discern such boundaries of perception. Even now, I often struggle to differentiate between my own thoughts and what others have written in books. I suppose this is because most of my impressions of things are obtained through the eyes and ears of others. After completing the story, I read it to Miss Sullivan. I still remember how I delighted in those wonderful passages and how I struggled with the words that needed to be repeated. During dinner, I read it aloud to my family, and everyone was astonished. They didn't expect me to write so well, and some even asked if I had read it in a book. This question surprised me because I couldn't recall anyone reading the story to me. So, I confidently replied, no, I wrote it myself, and I want to dedicate it to Mr. Anagnos. Subsequently, I rewrote it and, following their suggestions, changed the title from Autumn Leaves to The Frost King. I sent it to Mr. Anagnos as a birthday congratulation. Little did I dream that this birthday gift would bring me so much trouble and cruel turmoil. Mr. Anagnos loved the story and published it in the Perkins School magazine. My heart swelled with pride, but soon it plummeted into the depths of anguish and despair. Shortly after I arrived in Boston, someone discovered that The Frost King bore striking similarities to a story called The Frost Fairies by Miss Margaret T. Canby, which had been written and included in a collection titled Birdie and His Friends Before My Birth. The two stories shared similar ideas, content, and language, leading some to accuse me of reading Miss Canby's story and plagiarizing it. Initially, I didn't fully understand the severity of the issue, but when I did, I felt both astonished and sorrowful. I experienced a pain that no child should endure. I felt ashamed and witnessed suspicion cast upon the people I loved the most. What on earth was happening? I racked my brain, trying to recall what books I had read before writing The Frost King, and whether I had come across any writings or books about frost. I couldn't remember, except for a vague recollection of someone mentioning Jack Frost and a poem titled Frost's Fancy, written for children by Jack Thayer Frost. However, I hadn't quoted them. At first, Mr. Anagnos believed me, though he was troubled by the matter. He showed me kindness. However, things continued to deteriorate, and in order to make him happy, I put on a forced smile and tried to appear cheerful. During the celebration of Washington's birthday, I participated in a masquerade play where I played the role of the goddess of grain. I remember that day, dressed in a beautiful outfit, wearing a colorful wreath made of autumn leaves on my head, and my hands and feet adorned with fruits and grains. But beneath the vibrant and lively appearance, my heart was filled with sadness. On the eve of the celebration, a teacher at the school asked about the story again. I told him that Miss Sullivan had talked to me about Jack Frost and his remarkable works. Somehow, some of my words made her think that I remembered Miss Canby's story, The Frost Fairies. Despite repeatedly emphasizing that she misunderstood, she stubbornly conveyed this erroneous conclusion to Mr. Anagnos. Mr. Anagnos, who had always taken care of me earnestly, believed the words of this teacher and thought that I had deceived him. He turned a deaf ear to my innocent explanations. He believed, or at least felt, that Miss Sullivan and I deliberately stole someone else's work to win his praise. Soon after, I was brought before a 
court, composed of teachers and staff from the Perkins School for the Blind to answer questions. They kept Miss Sullivan away from me, and in the court, they interrogated me repeatedly, making me feel that I was being forced to admit that someone had read Miss Canby's story, The Frost Fairies, to me. With each question they asked, I felt a great sense of distrust, and I felt Mr. Anagnos looking at me with accusatory eyes. The feelings were indescribable in words. My heart pounded, and I answered their questions incoherently. Although I knew it was a terrible misunderstanding, I couldn't alleviate the pain within me. When the questioning finally ended and I was allowed to leave, I felt dizzy and had no energy to pay attention to Miss Sullivan's comfort or the encouragement of my friends. That night, I lay on my bed and wept bitterly, perhaps sadder than most children. I felt a chill running through my body and thought that maybe I wouldn't live until the next morning. The thought actually brought me some relief. Looking back now, if this had happened when I was older, it would have surely driven me to a mental breakdown. Fortunately, during those sorrowful days, the angels of forgetfulness banished much of my sadness and worries. Miss Sullivan had never heard of the story, The Frost Fairies, or Miss Canby's book. With the help of Dr. Bell, she carefully investigated the matter. In the end, it was discovered that Mrs. Hobine had a copy of Miss Canby's book, Birdie and His Friends, in 1888. It happened that summer we were on vacation in Brewster together. Mrs. Hobine couldn't find the book anymore, but she told me that Miss Sullivan went on vacation alone and often read interesting stories to me from various books to keep me entertained. Although she, like me, didn't remember reading The Frost Fairies, she was certain that she had selected stories from the book, Birdie and His Friends, to read to me. Mrs. Hobine explained that before selling the house in Brewster, she had dealt with many children's books, such as textbooks and fairy tales. Birdie and His Friends might have been disposed of at that time as well. At that time, stories held no meaning for me, but the peculiar and whimsical words in those stories piqued the interest of a child like me who had no other forms of entertainment. Although I can't recall the exact circumstances of those storytelling moments, I must admit that I made a great effort to remember those unfamiliar words so that I could ask my teacher to explain them to me when she returned. When Miss Sally then came back, I didn't mention the novel, Frost Fairy, to her, perhaps because she immediately began reading, Sir Ferdinando, leaving no space in my mind for anything else. However, Mrs. Hopkins had indeed read Campbell's story to me, and though I had forgotten about it for a long time, it naturally resurfaced in my mind without feeling like someone else's creation. During those troubled days, I received many letters expressing sympathy and greetings. Miss Campbell herself wrote to encourage me, saying, One day you will write your own masterpiece, inspiring and helping many. However, this wonderful prophecy never came true. From then on, I dared not engage in wordplay anymore. I was always apprehensive, fearing that what I wrote was not my own thoughts. For a long time, even when writing letters to my mother, I would be overcome with sudden terror, repeatedly scrutinizing each sentence to ensure it was not borrowed from the books I had read. If it weren't for Miss Sullivan's unwavering encouragement, I might never have picked up pen and paper again. Later on, I read Frost Fairy again and revisited some of the letters I had written at that time. I discovered numerous similarities in terms of vocabulary, phrasing, and viewpoints with Campbell's book. For example, a letter I wrote to Mr. Anagnos on September 29, 1891, displayed the same emotions and language as Miss Campbell's work. Similarly, my story, 
the Frost King, like many other letters, showed traces of being influenced by that tale. In my letters, I assimilated sentences I liked and presented them as my own thoughts, even creating new sentences that mimicked the same style. This often appeared in my early correspondence and initial works. In an article describing ancient cities in Greece and Italy, I included vivid and evocative descriptions whose origin I had long forgotten. I knew Mr. Anagnos had a great fondness for historical sites, especially in Italy and Greece. Thus, while reading, I carefully collected fragments from poetry collections and history books that I thought would please him. When he praised my essays on these ancient cities, he would say, very poetic. However, I couldn't understand how he believed that a blind and deaf child of asterisk asterisk years old could write such works. Nevertheless, I also believed that using other people's words in my compositions didn't render them worthless. It simply showed that I could employ clear and vivid language to express my appreciation for beautiful and poetic imagery. My early works were merely intellectual exercises, like those of all young people. Through imitation and absorption, I gradually learned to express my thoughts with words. Anything that captured my interest in books, whether consciously or unconsciously, would be stored in my mind and become part of me. Stevenson once said that novice writers tend to instinctively imitate the works they admire most and then transform them with astonishing originality. Even great writers require years of practice to harness the vast expanse of words that congest their thoughts. Perhaps even now, I have yet to complete this process. Honestly, I often struggle to distinguish between my own thoughts and those acquired from books. The words on the page have become an inseparable part of my thinking. In all my works, there is always a garment that resembles the clothes I used to sew when I was learning, often made from patchwork of broken fabrics. Although they are made up of various colorful silk and velvet pieces, the majority is rough cloth and stands out the most. Similarly, although my essays reflect some of my rough and immature thoughts, they are also mixed with brilliant ideas and more mature perspectives from others, which I have learned from books and kept in my heart. In my view, a major difficulty in writing is when the ideas that come to mind are still unorganized, on the edge of emotions and thoughts, and figuring out how to express them using the language we have learned. Writing is like arranging a tangram puzzle. We first have a pattern in our minds and then depict it with words. However, sometimes the words that come to mind may not be suitable. Even so, I never give up and make another attempt because I know that if others have succeeded, I can succeed too. How can I admit defeat? Stevenson once said, if a person is not born with creative talent, they will never create anything in their lifetime. Although I may be such a person, I still hope that one day my writing will improve, and I will be able to fully express my thoughts and experiences. It is with this hope and belief that I persistently strive and overcome the pain caused by the Frost King incident. From another perspective, this unpleasant incident has its benefits for me as well. It forced me to seriously contemplate some issues related to writing. The only regret is that it cost me the friendship of Mr. Anagnos, my best friend. After I published, my life, in the Women's Home magazine, Mr. Anagnos wrote in a letter to Mr. Macy that he believed in my innocence during the Frost King incident. He mentioned that the court consisted of eight members, four blind people and four people with normal eyesight. Four of them believed that I had prior knowledge of Miss Canby's story, while the others did not. Mr. Anagnos said he stood with the latter group. But regardless of where Mr. Anagnos stood, when I entered that room and sensed the skepticism from the people inside, 
I felt a hostile atmosphere and an ominous premonition. The subsequent events confirmed my intuition. Prior to that, it was in that room where Mr. Anagnos often held me on his lap, put down his work, and played with me for a while. I could feel that during the two years after that incident, Mr. Anagnos believed in my and Miss Sullivan's innocence. Later, for some unknown reason, he changed his mind. I am not quite sure why Perkins School for the Blind had to investigate this matter, and I can't even recall the names of the court members as they stopped talking to me. At that time, I was too overwhelmed to pay attention to anything else. I only felt fear and couldn't answer any questions. Indeed, at that time, I hardly thought about what I should say or what people said to me. I have written the details of the Frost King incident truthfully because it had a significant impact on my early life and education. It is also to avoid misunderstandings that I have tried to narrate all the relevant facts as accurately as possible, without wanting to defend myself or blame anyone. During the year following the incident, I returned to my hometown and reunited with my family, and I was happy. All the worries were left behind. The summer slowly passed, and autumn quietly arrived. The ground was covered with deep red and golden autumn leaves, and the grapes on the vine at the end of the garden gradually turned dark purple under the sunlight. It was during this time that I started writing articles recalling my life experiences, precisely one year after I wrote The Frost King story. At that time, I still had doubts about what I wrote, and I was often tormented by thoughts that might not entirely belong to me. Only Miss Sullivan knew the fears and anxieties within me. I don't know why I became so sensitive and always tried to avoid mentioning the Frost King again. Sometimes during conversations, a deep consciousness flashed through my mind, and I whispered to her, I don't know if this is truly my own. Sometimes, while writing, I would mutter to myself, what if this turns out to be like someone else's work from a long time ago? What should I do? Just thinking about it made my hand tremble uncontrollably, and I couldn't write anything for the rest of the day. Even now, I sometimes feel the same anxiety and uneasiness. That dreadful experience left a permanent scar on my soul, and its significance is only now starting to become clear to me. Miss Sullivan always comforted me and did her best to help me. To restore my confidence, she encouraged me to write a short essay about my life for the youth's companion. I was only 12 years old at the time, and it was a challenging task. Looking back now, it seems that I already foresaw the benefits I would gain from this writing, otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to write it. I proceeded cautiously but persevered. Miss Sullivan was there to encourage and guide me. She knew that as long as I kept writing, I would regain my confidence and unleash my abilities. Before the Frost King incident, I lived a carefree life like other children, but later, I became silent and often contemplated things that were invisible. Over time, I gradually overcame the shadow cast by that unpleasant experience. Through perseverance and refinement, my mind became clearer than before, and I gained a deeper understanding and insight into life. 16. Niagara and the World's Fair. The chief events of the year 1893 were my trip to Washington during the inauguration of President Cleveland, and visits to Niagara and the World's Fair. Under such circumstances my studies were constantly interrupted and often put aside for many weeks, so that it is impossible for me to give a connected account of them. We went to Niagara in March, 1893. It is difficult to describe my emotions when I stood on the point which overhangs the American Falls and felt the air vibrate and the earth tremble. 
It seems strange to many people that I should be impressed by the wonders and beauties of Niagara. They are always asking, what does this beauty or that music mean to you? You cannot see the waves rolling up the beach or hear their roar. What do they mean to you? In the most evident sense they mean everything. I cannot fathom or define their meaning any more than I can fathom or define love or religion or goodness. During the summer of 1893, Miss Sullivan and I visited the World's Fair with Dr. Alexander Graham Bell. I recall with unmixed delight those days when a thousand childish fancies became beautiful realities. Every day in imagination I made a trip round the world and I saw many wonders from the uttermost parts of the earth, marvels of invention, treasuries of industry and skill and all the activities of human life actually passed under my fingertips. I like to visit the Midway Plaisance. It seemed like the Arabian Nights, it was crammed so full of novelty and interest. Here was the India of my books in the curious bazaar with its Shivas and elephant gods, there was the land of the pyramids concentrated in a model Cairo with its mosques and its long processions of camels. Yonder were the lagoons of Venice, where we sailed every evening when the city and the fountains were illuminated. I also went on board a Viking ship which lay a short distance from the little craft. I had been on a man of war before, in Boston, and it interested me to see, on this Viking ship. How the seaman was once all in all, how he sailed and took storm and calm alike with undaunted heart, and gave chase to whosoever re-echoed his cry, we are of the sea, and fought with brains and sinews, self-reliant, self-sufficient, instead of being thrust into the background by unintelligent machinery, as Jack is today. So it always is, man only is interesting to man. At a little distance from this ship, there was a model of the Santa Maria, which I also examined. The captain showed me Columbus's cabin and the desk with an hourglass on it. This small instrument impressed me most because it made me think how weary the heroic navigator must have felt as he saw the sand dropping grain by grain while desperate men were plotting against his life. Mr. Higginbotham, president of the World's Fair, kindly gave me permission to touch the exhibits, and with an eagerness as insatiable as that with which Pizarro seized the treasures of Peru, I took in the glories of the fair with my fingers. It was a sort of tangible kaleidoscope, this white city of the West. Everything fascinated me, especially the French bronzes. They were so lifelike, I thought they were angel visions which the artist had caught and bound in earthly forms. At the Cape of Good Hope exhibit, I learned much about the processes of mining diamonds. Whenever it was possible, I touched the machinery while it was in motion, so as to get a clearer idea how the stones were weighed, cut, and polished. I searched in the washings for a diamond and found it myself, the only true diamond, they said, that was ever found in the United States. Dr. Bell went everywhere with this and in his own delightful way described to me the objects of greatest interest. In the electrical building we examined the telephones, autophones, phonographs, and other inventions, and he made me understand how it is possible to send a message on wires that mock space and outrun time, and, like Prometheus, to draw fire from the sky. We also visited the anthropological department, and I was much interested in the relics of ancient Mexico, in the rude stone implements that are so often the only record of an age, the simple monuments of nature's unlettered children, so I thought as I fingered them, that seem bound to last while the memorials of kings and sages crumble in dust away, and in the Egyptian mummies, which I shrank from touching. From these relics I learned more about the progress of man than I have heard or read since.
All these experiences added a great many new terms to my vocabulary, and in the three weeks I spent at the fair I took a long leap from the little child's interest in fairy tales and toys to the appreciation of the real and the earnest in the workaday world. Before October, 1893, I had studied various subjects by myself in a more or less desultory manner. I read the histories of Greece, Rome and the United States. I had a French grammar in raised print, and as I already knew some French, I often amused myself by composing in my head short exercises, using the new words as I came across them, and ignoring rules and other technicalities as much as possible. I even tried, without aid, to master the French pronunciation, as I found all the letters and sounds described in the book. Of course this was tasking slender powers for great ends, but it gave me something to do on a rainy day, and I acquired a sufficient knowledge of French to read with pleasure La Fontaine's, Fables, Le Médecin Malgré Louis, and passages from, Athalie. I also gave considerable time to the improvement of my speech. I read aloud to Miss Sullivan and recited passages from my favorite poets, which I had committed to memory, she corrected my pronunciation and helped me to phrase and inflect. It was not, however, until October, 1893, after I had recovered from the fatigue and excitement of my visit to the World's Fair, that I began to have lessons in special subjects at fixed hours. Miss Sullivan and I were at that time in Halton, Pennsylvania, visiting the family of Mr. William Wade. Mr. Irons, a neighbor of theirs, was a good Latin scholar, it was arranged that I should study under him. I remember him as a man of rare, sweet nature and of wide experience. He taught me Latin grammar principally, but he often helped me in arithmetic, which I found as troublesome as it was uninteresting. Mr. Irons also read with me Tennyson's In Memoriam. I had read many books before, but never from a critical point of view. I learned for the first time to know an author, to recognize his style as I recognize the clasp of a friend's hand. At first I was rather unwilling to study Latin grammar. It seemed absurd to waste time analyzing every word I came across, noun, genitive, singular, feminine, when its meaning was quite plain. I thought I might just as well describe my pet in order to know it, order, vertebrate, division, quadruped, class, mammalia, genus, felinus, species, cat, individual, tabby. But as I got deeper into the subject, I became more interested, and the beauty of the language delighted me. I often amused myself by reading Latin passages, picking up words I understood and trying to make sense. I have never ceased to enjoy this pastime. There is nothing more beautiful, I think, than the evanescent fleeting images and sentiments presented by a language one is just becoming familiar with. Ideas that flit across the mental sky, shaped and tinted by capricious fancy. Miss Sullivan sat beside me at my lessons, spelling into my hand whatever Mr. Irons said, and looking up new words for me. I was just beginning to read Caesar's Gallic War when I went to my home in Alabama. Chapter 17 Study in New York In the summer of 1894, I attended the meeting at Chautauqua of the American Association to promote the teaching of speech to the deaf. There it was arranged that I should go to the Wright Hugh Mason School for the Deaf in New York City. I went there in October 1894, accompanied by Miss Sullivan. This school was chosen to obtain the highest advantages in vocal culture and training in lip reading. In addition to my work in these subjects, I studied, during the two years I was in school, arithmetic, physical geography, French and German. Miss Remy, my German teacher, could use the manual alphabet. 
After I had acquired a small vocabulary, we talked together in German whenever we had a chance, and in a few months, I could understand almost everything she said. Before the end of the first year, I read, Wilhelm Tell, with the greatest delight. Indeed, I think I made more progress in German than in any of my other studies. I found French much more difficult. I studied it with Madame Olivier, a French lady who did not know the manual alphabet, and who was obliged to give her instruction orally. I could not read her lips easily, so my progress was much slower than in German. I managed, however, to read Le Médecin Malgré Louis again. It was very amusing but I did not like it nearly so well as Wilhelm Tell. My progress in lip reading and speech was not what my teachers and I had hoped and expected it would be. It was my ambition to speak like other people, and my teachers believed that this could be accomplished. But, although we worked hard and faithfully, we did not quite reach our goal. I suppose we aimed too high, and disappointment was therefore inevitable. I still regarded arithmetic as a system of pitfalls. I hung about the dangerous frontier of, guess, avoiding with infinite trouble to myself and others the broad valley of reason. When I was not guessing, I was jumping to conclusions, and this fault, in addition to my dullness, aggravated my difficulties more than was proper or necessary. Underwood and Underwood, Miss Helen Keller reading Mrs. Coolidge's Lips, 1926. But although these disappointments caused me great depression at times, I pursued my other studies with unflagging interest, especially physical geography. It was a joy to learn the secrets of nature. How, in the picturesque language of the Old Testament, the winds are made to blow from the four corners of the heavens, how the vapors ascend from the ends of the earth, how rivers are cut out among the rocks and mountains overturned by the roots, and in what ways man may overcome many forces mightier than himself. The two years in New York were happy ones, and I look back to them with genuine pleasure. I remember especially the walks we all took together every day in Central Park, the only part of the city that was congenial to me. I never lost a jot of my delight in this great park. I loved to have it described every time I entered it, for it was beautiful in all its aspects, and these aspects were so many that it was beautiful in a different way each day of the nine months I spent in New York. In the spring, we made excursions to various places of interest. We sailed on the Hudson River and wandered about on its green banks, of which Bryant loved to sing. I liked the simple, wild grandeur of the Palisades. Among the places I visited were West Point, Terrytown, the home of Washington Irving, where I walked through Sleepy Hollow. The teachers at the Wright Humason School were always planning how they might give the pupils every advantage that those who here enjoy, how they might make much of few tendencies and passive memories in the cases of the little ones, and lead them out of the cramping circumstances in which their lives were set. Before I left New York, these bright days were darkened by the greatest sorrow that I have ever borne, except the death of my father. Mr. John P. Spaulding, of Boston, died in February 1896. Only those who knew and loved him best can understand what his friendship meant to me. He, who made everyone happy in a beautiful, unobtrusive way, was most kind and tender to Miss Sullivan and me. So long as we felt his loving presence and knew that he took a watchful interest in our work, fraught with so many difficulties, we could not be discouraged. His going away left a vacancy in our lives that has never been filled. Chapter 18 In October, 1896, I entered the Cambridge School for Young Ladies, to be prepared for Radcliffe. When I was a little girl, I visited Wellesley and surprised my friends by the announcement, Someday I shall go to college, but I shall go to Harvard. 
When asked why I would not go to Wellesley, I replied that there were only girls there. The thought of going to college took root in my heart and became an earnest desire, which impelled me to enter into competition for a degree with seeing and hearing girls, in the face of the strong opposition of many true and wise friends. When I left New York the idea had become a fixed purpose, and it was decided that I should go to Cambridge. This was the nearest approach I could get to Harvard and to the fulfillment of my childish declaration. At the Cambridge School the plan was to have Miss Sullivan attend the classes with me and interpret to me the instruction given. Of course my instructors had had no experience in teaching any but normal pupils, and my only means of conversing with them was reading their lips. My studies for the first year were English history, English literature, German, Latin, arithmetic, Latin composition and occasional themes. Until then I had never taken a course of study with the idea of preparing for college, but I had been well drilled in English by Miss Sullivan, and it soon became evident to my teachers that I needed no special instruction in this subject beyond a critical study of the books prescribed by the college. I had had, moreover, a good start in French, and received six months' instruction in Latin, but German was the subject with which I was most familiar. In spite, however, of these advantages, there were serious drawbacks to my progress. Miss Sullivan could not spell out in my hand all that the books required, and it was very difficult to have textbooks embossed in time to be of use to me although my friends in London and Philadelphia were willing to hasten the work. For a while, indeed, I had to copy my Latin in Braille, so that I could recite with the other girls. My instructors soon became sufficiently familiar with my imperfect speech to answer my questions readily and correct mistakes. I could not make notes in class or write exercises but I wrote all my compositions and translations at home on my typewriter. Each day Miss Sullivan went to the classes with me and spelled into my hand with infinite patience all that the teachers said. In study hours she had to look up new words for me and read and reread notes and books I did not have in raised print. The tedium of that work is hard to conceive. Frau Grote, my German teacher, and Mr. Gilman, the principal, were the only teachers in the school who learned the finger alphabet to give me instruction. No one realized more fully than dear Frau Grote how slow and inadequate her spelling was. Nevertheless, in the goodness of her heart she laboriously spelled out her instructions to me in special lessons twice a week, to give Miss Sullivan a little rest. But, though everybody was kind and ready to help us, there was only one hand that could turn drudgery into pleasure. That year I finished arithmetic, reviewed my Latin grammar, and read three chapters of Caesar's Gallic War. In German I read, partly with my fingers and partly with Miss Sullivan's assistance, Schiller's Lied von der Glock, and Tauker, Heine's Harsries, Freytag's Aus dem Stadt Friedrichs de Grossen, Reels, Flutsch der Schonheit, Lessing's, Minna von Barnhelm, and Goethe's, Aus meinem Leben. I took the greatest delight in these German books, especially Schiller's wonderful lyrics, the history of Frederick the Great's magnificent achievements and the account of Goethe's life. I was sorry to finish, Die Harsries, so full of happy witticisms and charming descriptions of vine-clad hills, streams that sing and ripple in the sunshine, and wild regions, sacred to tradition and legend, the grey sisters of a long-vanished, imaginative age, descriptions such as can be given only by those to whom nature is a feeling, a love and an appetite. Mr. Gilman instructed me part of the year in English literature. We read together, as you like it, Burke's Speech on Conciliation with America and Macaulay's Life of Samuel Johnson. 
Mr. Gilman's broad views of history and literature and his clever explanations made my work easier and pleasanter than it could have been had I only read notes mechanically with the necessarily brief explanations given in the classes. Burke's speech was more instructive than any other book on a political subject that I had ever read. My mind stirred with the stirring times, and the characters round which the life of two contending nations centered seemed to move right before me. I wondered more and more, while Burke's masterly speech rolled on in mighty surges of eloquence, how it was that King George and his ministers could have turned a deaf ear to his warning prophecy of our victory and their humiliation. Then I entered into the melancholy details of the relation in which the great statesman stood to his party and to the representatives of the people. I thought how strange it was that such precious seeds of truth and wisdom should have fallen among the tares of ignorance and corruption. In a different way Macaulay's Life of Samuel Johnson was interesting. My heart went out to the lonely man who ate the bread of affliction in Grub Street, and yet, in the midst of toil and cruel suffering of body and soul, always had a kind word, and lent a helping hand to the poor and despised. I rejoiced over all his successes, I shut my eyes to his faults, and wondered, not that he had them, but that they had not crushed or dwarfed his soul. But in spite of Macaulay's brilliancy and his admirable faculty of making the commonplace seem fresh and picturesque, his positiveness wearied me at times, and his frequent sacrifices of truth to effect kept me in a questioning attitude very unlike the attitude of reverence in which I had listened to the Demosthenes of Great Britain. At the Cambridge School, for the first time in my life, I enjoyed the companionship of seeing and hearing girls of my own age. I lived with several others in one of the pleasant houses connected with the school, the house where Mr. Howells used to live, and we all had the advantage of home life. I joined them in many of their games, even blind man's buff and frolics in the snow. I took long walks with them. We discussed our studies and read aloud the things that interested us. Some of the girls learned to speak to me, so that Miss Sullivan did not have to repeat their conversation. At Christmas, my mother and little sister spent the holidays with me, and Mr. Gilman kindly offered to let Mildred study in his school. So Mildred stayed with me in Cambridge, and for six happy months we were hardly ever apart. It makes me most happy to remember the hours we spent helping each other in study and sharing our recreation together. I took my preliminary examinations for Radcliffe from the 29th of June to the 3rd of July in 1897. The subjects I offered were elementary and advanced German, French, Latin, English, and Greek and Roman history, making nine hours in all. I passed in everything, and received, honors, in German and English. Perhaps an explanation of the method that was in use when I took my examinations will not be amiss here. The student was required to pass in 16 hours, 12 hours being called elementary and 4 advanced. He had to pass 5 hours at a time to have them counted. The examination papers were given out at nine o'clock at Harvard and brought to Radcliffe by a special messenger. Each candidate was known, not by his name, but by a number. I was number 233, but, as I had to use a typewriter, my identity could not be concealed. It was thought advisable for me to have my examinations in a room by myself, because the noise of the typewriter might disturb the other girls. Mr. Gilman read all the papers to me by means of the manual alphabet. A man was placed on guard at the door to prevent interruption. The first day I had German. Mr. Gilman sat beside me and read the paper through first, then sentence by sentence, while I repeated the words aloud, to make sure that I understood him perfectly. 
The papers were difficult, and I felt very anxious as I wrote out my answers on the typewriter. Mr. Gilman spelled to me what I had written, and I made such changes as I thought necessary, and he inserted them. I wish to say here that I have not had this advantage since in any of my examinations. At Radcliffe no one reads the papers to me after they are written, and I have no opportunity to correct errors unless I finish before the time is up. In that case I correct only such mistakes as I can recall in the few minutes allowed, and make notes of these corrections at the end of my paper. If I passed with higher credit in the preliminaries than in the finals, there are two reasons. In the finals, no one read my work over to me, and in the preliminaries I offered subjects with some of which I was in a measure familiar before my work in the Cambridge School. For at the beginning of the year I had passed examinations in English, history, French and German, which Mr. Gilman gave me from previous Harvard papers. Mr. Gilman sent my written work to the examiners with a certificate that I, candidate number 233, had written the papers. All the other preliminary examinations were conducted in the same manner. None of them was so difficult as the first. I remember that the day the Latin paper was brought to us, Professor Schilling came in and informed me I had passed satisfactorily in German. This encouraged me greatly, and I sped on to the end of the ordeal with a light heart and a chapter 19, collage study. When I began my second year at the Gilman School, I was full of hope and determination to succeed. But during the first few weeks I was confronted with unforeseen difficulties. Mr. Gilman had agreed that that year I should study mathematics principally. I had physics, algebra, geometry, astronomy, Greek and Latin. Unfortunately, many of the books I needed had not been embossed in time for me to begin with the classes, and I lacked important apparatus for some of my studies. The classes I was in were very large, and it was impossible for the teachers to give me special instruction. Miss Sullivan was obliged to read all the books to me, and interpret for the instructors, and for the first time in eleven years it seemed as if her dear hand would not be equal to the task. It was necessary for me to write algebra and geometry in class and solve problems in physics, and this I could not do until we bought a braille writer, by means of which I could put down the steps and processes of my work. I could not follow with my eyes the geometrical figures drawn on the blackboard, and my only means of getting a clear idea of them was to make them on a cushion with straight and curved wires, which had bent and pointed ends. I had to carry in my mind, as Mr. Keith says in his report, the lettering of the figures, the hypothesis and conclusion, the construction and the process of the proof. In a word, every study had its obstacles. Sometimes I lost all courage and betrayed my feelings in a way I am ashamed to remember, especially as the signs of my trouble were afterward used against Miss Sullivan, the only person of all the kind friends I had there, who could make the crooked straight and the rough places smooth. Little by little, however, my difficulties began to disappear. The embossed books and other apparatus arrived, and I threw myself into the work with renewed confidence. Algebra and geometry were the only studies that continued to defy my efforts to comprehend them. As I have said before, I had no aptitude for mathematics, the different points were not explained to me as fully as I wished. The geometrical diagrams were particularly vexing because I could not see the relation of the different parts to one another, even on the cushion. It was not until Mr. Keith taught me that I had a clear idea of mathematics. I was beginning to overcome these difficulties when an event occurred which changed everything. Just before the books came, Mr. Gilman had begun to remonstrate with Miss Sullivan on the ground that I was working too hard, and in spite of my earnest protestations, he reduced the number of my recitations. 
At the beginning we had agreed that I should, if necessary, take five years to prepare for college, but at the end of the first year the success of my examinations showed Miss Sullivan, Miss Harbaugh, Mr. Gilman's head teacher, and one other, that I could without too much effort complete my preparation in two years more. Mr. Gilman at first agreed to this, but when my tasks had become somewhat perplexing, he insisted that I was overworked, and that I should remain at his school three years longer. I did not like his plan, for I wished to enter college with my class. On the 17th of November I was not very well, and did not go to school. Although Miss Sullivan knew that my indisposition was not serious, yet Mr. Gilman, on hearing of it, declared that I was breaking down and made changes in my studies which would have rendered it impossible for me to take my final examinations with my class. In the end the difference of opinion between Mr. Gilman and Miss Sullivan resulted in my mother's withdrawing my sister Mildred and me from the Cambridge School. After some delay it was arranged that I should continue my studies under a tutor, Mr. Merton S. Keith, of Cambridge. Miss Sullivan and I spent the rest of the winter with our friends, the Chamberlains in Rentham, 25 miles from Boston. From February to July, 1898, Mr. Keith came out to Rentham twice a week and taught me algebra, geometry, Greek and Latin. Miss Sullivan interpreted his instruction. In October, 1898, we returned to Boston. For eight months Mr. Keith gave me lessons five times a week, in periods of about an hour. He explained each time what I did not understand in the previous lesson, assigned new work, and took home with him the Greek exercises which I had written during the week on my typewriter corrected them fully, and returned them to me. In this way my preparation for college went on without interruption. I found it much easier and pleasanter to be taught by myself than to receive instruction in class. There was no hurry, no confusion. My tutor had plenty of time to explain what I did not understand, so I got on faster and did better work than I ever did in school. I still found more difficulty in mastering problems in mathematics than I did in any other of my studies. I wish algebra and geometry had been half as easy as the languages and literature. But even mathematics Mr. Keith made interesting, he succeeded in whittling problems small enough to get through my brain. He kept my mind alert and eager, and trained it to reason clearly, and to seek conclusions calmly and logically, instead of jumping wildly into space and arriving nowhere. He was always gentle and forbearing, no matter how dull I might be, and believe me, my stupidity would often have exhausted the patience of Job. On the 29th and 30th of June, 1899, I took my final examinations for Radcliffe College. The first day I had elementary Greek and advanced Latin, and the second day geometry, algebra and advanced Greek. The college authorities did not allow Miss Sullivan to read the examination papers to me. So Mr. Eugene C. Vining, one of the instructors at the Perkins Institution for the Blind, was employed to copy the papers for me in American Braille. Mr. Vining was a stranger to me, and could not communicate with me, except by writing Braille. The proctor was also a stranger, and did not attempt to communicate with me in any way. The Braille worked well enough in the languages, but when it came to geometry and algebra, difficulties arose. I was sorely perplexed, and felt discouraged wasting much precious time, especially in algebra. It is true that I was familiar with all literary braille in common use in this country, English, American, and New York Point. But the various signs and symbols in geometry and algebra in the three systems are very different, and I had used only the English braille in my algebra. 
Two days before the examinations, Mr. Vining sent me a braille copy of one of the old Harvard papers in algebra. To my dismay I found that it was in the American notation. I sat down immediately and wrote to Mr. Vining, asking him to explain the signs. I received another paper in a table of signs by return mail, and I set to work to learn the notation. But on the night before the algebra examination, while I was struggling over some very complicated examples, I could not tell the combinations of bracket, brace and radical. Both Mr. Keith and I were distressed and full of forebodings for the morrow, but we went over to the college a little before the examination began, and had Mr. Vining explain more fully the American symbols. In geometry my chief difficulty was that I had always been accustomed to read the propositions in line print, or to have them spelled into my hand, and somehow, although the propositions were right before me, I found the braille confusing, and could not fix clearly in my mind what I was reading. But when I took up algebra I had a harder time still. The signs, which I had so lately learned, and which I thought I knew, perplexed me. Besides, I could not see what I wrote on my typewriter. I had always done my work in braille or in my head. Mr. Keith had relied too much on my ability to solve problems mentally, and had not trained me to write examination papers. Consequently my work was painfully slow, and I had to read the examples over and over before I could form any idea of what I was required to do. Indeed, I am not sure now that I read all the signs correctly. I found it very hard to keep my wits about me. But I do not blame anyone. The administrative board of Radcliffe did not realize how difficult they were making my examinations, nor did they understand the peculiar difficulties I had to surmount. But if they unintentionally placed obstacles in my way, I have the consolation of knowing that I overcame them all. That I should study another year under Mr. Keith. It was not, therefore, until the fall of 1900 that my dream of going to college was realized. I remember my first day at Radcliffe. It was a day full of interest for me. I had looked forward to it for years. A potent force within me, stronger than the persuasion of my friends, stronger even than the pleadings of my heart, had impelled me to try my strength by the standards of those who see and hear. I knew that there were obstacles in the way, but I was eager to overcome them. I had taken to heart the words of the wise Roman who said, to be banished from Rome is but to live outside of Rome. Debarred from the great highways of knowledge, I was compelled to make the journey across country by unfrequented roads. That was all. And I knew that in college there were many by paths where I could touch hands with girls who were thinking, loving and struggling like me. I began my studies with eagerness. Before me I saw a new world opening in beauty and light, and I felt within me the capacity to know all things. In the wonderland of mind I should be as free as another. Its people, scenery, manners, joys, tragedies should be living, tangible interpreters of the real world. The lecture halls seemed filled with the spirit of the great and the wise, and I thought the professors were the embodiment of wisdom. If I have since learned differently, I am not going to tell anybody. But I soon discovered that college was not quite the romantic lyceum I had imagined. Many of the dreams that had delighted my young inexperience became beautifully less and faded into the light of common day. Gradually I began to find that there were disadvantages in going to college. The one I felt and still feel most is lack of time. I used to have time to think, to reflect, my mind and I. We would sit together of an evening and listen to the inner melodies of the spirit, which one hears only in leisure moments when the words of some loved poet touch a deep, sweet chord in the soul that until then had been silent. 
But in college there is no time to commune with one's thoughts. One goes to college to learn, it seems, not to think. When one enters the portals of learning, one leaves the dearest pleasures, solitude, books and imagination, outside with the whispering pines. I suppose I ought to find some comfort in the thought that I am laying up treasures for future enjoyment, but I am improvident enough to prefer present joy to hoarding riches against a rainy day. My studies the first year were French, German, history, English composition and English literature. In the French course I read some of the works of Corneille, Moliere, Racine, Alfred de Musset and Saint Beuve, and in the German those of Goethe and Schiller. I reviewed rapidly the whole period of history from the fall of the Roman Empire to the 18th century, and in English literature studied critically Milton's poems and Areopagitica. I am frequently asked how I overcome the peculiar conditions under which I work in college. In the classroom I am of course practically alone. The professor is as remote as if you were speaking through a telephone. The lectures are spelled into my hand as rapidly as possible, and much of the individuality of the lecturer is lost to me in the effort to keep in the race. The words rush through my hand like hounds in pursuit of a hare which they often miss. But in this respect I do not think I am much worse off than the girls who take notes. If the mind is occupied with the mechanical process of hearing and putting words on paper at pell-mell speed, I should not think one could pay much attention to the subject under consideration or the manner in which it is presented. I cannot make notes during the lectures because my hands are busy listening. Usually I jot down what I can remember of them when I get home. I write the exercises, daily themes, criticisms and hour tests, the mid-year and final examinations, on my typewriter, so that the professors have no difficulty in finding out how little I know. When I began the study of Latin prosody, I devised and explained to my professor a system of signs indicating the different meters and quantities. I use the Hammond typewriter. I have tried many machines, and I find the Hammond is the best adapted to the peculiar needs of my work. With this machine movable type shuttles can be used, and one can have several shuttles, each with a different set of characters, Greek, French, or mathematical, according to the kind of writing one wishes to do on the typewriter. Without it, I doubt if I could go to college. Very few of the books required in the various courses are printed for the blind, and I am obliged to have them spelled into my hand. Consequently I need more time to prepare my lessons than other girls. The manual part takes longer, and I have perplexities which they have not. There are days when the close attention I must give to details chafes my spirit, and the thought that I must spend hours reading a few chapters, while in the world without other girls are laughing and singing and dancing, makes me rebellious, but I soon recover my buoyancy and laugh the discontent out of my heart. For, after all, everyone who wishes to gain true knowledge must climb the hill difficulty alone, and since there is no royal road to the summit, I must zigzag it in my own way. I slip back many times, I fall, I stand still, I run against the edge of hidden obstacles, I lose my temper and find it again and keep it better, I trudge on, I gain a little, I feel encouraged, I get more eager and climb higher and begin to see the widening horizon. Every struggle is a victory. One more effort and I reach the luminous cloud, the blue depths of the sky, the uplands of my desire. I am not always alone, however, in these struggles. Mr. William Wade and Mr. E. E. Allen, principal of the Pennsylvania Institution for the Instruction of the Blind, get for me many of the books I need in raised print. Their thoughtfulness has been more of a help and encouragement to me than they can ever know. 
Last year, my second year at Radcliffe, I studied English composition, the Bible as English composition, the governments of America and Europe, the odes of Horace, and Latin comedy. The class in composition was the pleasantest. It was very lively. The lectures were always interesting, vivacious, witty, for the instructor, Mr. Charles Townsend Copeland, more than anyone else I have had until this year, brings before you literature in all its original freshness and power. For one short hour you are permitted to drink in the eternal beauty of the old masters without needless interpretation or exposition. You revel in their fine thoughts. You enjoy with all your soul the sweet thunder of the Old Testament, forgetting the existence of Yahweh and Elohim, and you go home feeling that you have had a glimpse of that perfection in which spirit and form dwell in immortal harmony, truth and beauty bearing a new growth on the ancient stem of time. This year is the happiest because I am studying subjects that especially interest me, economics, Elizabethan literature, Shakespeare under Professor George L. Kittredge, and the history of philosophy under Professor Josiah Royce. Through philosophy one enters with sympathy of comprehension into the traditions of remote ages and other modes of thought, which erewhile seemed alien and without reason. But college is not the universal Athens I thought it was. There one does not meet the great and the wise face to face, one does not even feel their living touch. They are there, it is true, but they seem mummified. We must extract them from the crannied wall of learning and dissect and analyze them before we can be sure that we have a Milton or an Isaiah, and not merely a clever imitation. Many scholars forget, it seems to me, that our enjoyment of the great works of literature depends more upon the depth of our sympathy than upon our understanding. The trouble is that very few of their laborious explanations stick in the memory. The mind drops them as a branch drops its overripe fruit. It is possible to know a flower, root and stem and all, and all the processes of growth, and yet to have no appreciation of the flower fresh bathed in heaven's dew. Again and again I ask impatiently, why concern myself with these explanations and hypotheses? They fly hither and thither in my thought like blind birds beating the air with ineffectual wings. I do not mean to object to a thorough knowledge of the famous works we read. I object only to the interminable comments and bewildering criticisms that teach but one thing. There are as many opinions as there are men. But when a great scholar like Professor Kittredge interprets what the master said, it is, as if new sight were given the blind. He brings back Shakespeare, the poet. There are, however, times when I long to sweep away half the things I am expected to learn, for the overtaxed mind cannot enjoy the treasure it has secured at the greatest cost. It is impossible, I think, to read in one day four or five different books in different languages and treating of widely different subjects, and not lose sight of the very ends for which one reads. When one reads hurriedly and nervously, having in mind written tests and examinations, one's brain becomes encumbered with a lot of choice brick a brack for which there seems to be little use. At the present time my mind is so full of heterogeneous matter that I almost despair of ever being able to put it in order. Whenever I enter the region that was the kingdom of my mind I feel like the proverbial bull in the china shop. A thousand odds and ends of knowledge come crashing about my head like hailstones, and when I try to escape them, theme goblins and college nixies of all sorts pursue me, until I wish. Oh, may I be forgiven the wicked wish, that I might smash the idols I came to worship. But the examinations are the chief bugbears of my college life. Although I have faced them many times and cast them down and made them bite the dust, 
yet they rise again and menace me with pale looks, until like Bob Akers I feel my courage oozing out at my finger ends. The days before these ordeals take place are spent in cramming your mind with mystic formula and indigestible dates, unpalatable diets, until you wish that books and science and you were buried in the depths of the sea. At last the dreaded hour arrives, and you are a favored being indeed if you feel prepared, and are able at the right time to call to your standard thoughts that will aid you in that supreme effort. It happens too often that your trumpet call is unheeded. It is most perplexing and exasperating that just at the moment when you need your memory and a nice sense of discrimination, these faculties take to themselves wings and fly away. The facts you have garnered with such infinite trouble invariably fail you at a pinch. Give a brief account of Huss and his work. Huss? Who was he and what did he do? The name looks strangely familiar. You ransack your budget of historic facts much as you would hunt for a bit of silk in a rag bag. You are sure it is somewhere in your mind near the top. You saw it there the other day when you were looking up the beginnings of the Reformation. But where is it now? You fish out all manner of odds and ends of knowledge, revolutions, schisms, massacres, systems of government, but Huss, where is he? You are amazed at all the things you know which are not on the examination paper. In desperation you seize the budget and dump everything out, and there in a corner is your man, serenely brooding on his own private thought, unconscious of the catastrophe which he has brought upon you. Just then the proctor informs you that the time is up. With a feeling of intense disgust you kick the mass of rubbish into a corner and go home, your head full of revolutionary schemes to abolish the divine right of professors to ask questions without the consent of the questioned. It comes over me that in the last two or three pages of this chapter I have used figures which will turn the laugh against me. Ah, here they are, the mixed metaphors mocking and strutting about before me, pointing to the bull in the china shop assailed by hailstones and the bugbears with pale looks, an unanalyzed species. Let them mock on. The words describe so exactly the atmosphere of jostling, tumbling ideas I live in that I will wink at them for once, and put on a deliberate air to say that my ideas of college have changed. While my days at Radcliffe were still in the future, they were encircled with a halo of romance, which they have lost. But in the transition from romantic to actual I have learned many things I should never have known had I not tried the experiment. One of them is the precious science of patience, which teaches us that we should take our education as we would take a walk in the country, leisurely, our minds hospitably open to impressions of every sort. Such knowledge floods the soul unseen with a soundless tidal wave of deepening thought. Knowledge is power. Rather, knowledge is happiness, because to have knowledge, broad, deep knowledge, is to know true ends from false, and lofty things from low. To know the thoughts and deeds that have marked man's progress is to feel the great heart throbs of humanity through the centuries, and if one does not feel in these pulsations a heavenward striving, one must indeed be deaf to the harmonies of life. Chapter 21, I have thus far sketched the events of my life, but I have not shown how much I have depended on books not only for pleasure and for the wisdom they bring to all who read, but also for that knowledge which comes to others through their eyes and their ears. Indeed, books have meant so much more in my education than in that of others, that I shall go back to the time when I began to read. I read my first connected story in May, 1887, when I was seven years old, and from that day to this I have devoured everything in the shape of a printed page that has come within the reach of my hungry fingertips. As I have said, I did not study regularly during the early years of my education, nor did I read according to rule. 
At first I had only a few books in raised print, readers, for beginners, a collection of stories for children, and a book about the earth called, Our World. I think that was all, but I read them over and over, until the words were so worn and pressed I could scarcely make them out. Sometimes Miss Sullivan read to me, spelling into my hand little stories and poems that she knew I should understand, but I preferred reading myself to being read to, because I liked to read again and again the things that pleased me. It was during my first visit to Boston that I really began to read in good earnest. I was permitted to spend a part of each day in the institution library, and to wander from bookcase to bookcase, and take down whatever book my fingers lighted upon. And read I did, whether I understood one word in ten or two words on a page. The words themselves fascinated me, but I took no conscious account of what I read. My mind must, however, have been very impressionable at that period, for it retained many words and whole sentences, to the meaning of which I had not the faintest clue. And afterward, when I began to talk and write, these words and sentences would flash out quite naturally, so that my friends wondered at the richness of my vocabulary. I must have read parts of many books, in those early days I think I never read any one book through, and a great deal of poetry in this uncomprehending way, until I discovered, Little Lord Fauntleroy, which was the first book of any consequence I read understandingly. One day my teacher found me in a corner of the library poring over the pages of, The Scarlet Letter. I was then about eight years old. I remember she asked me if I liked Little Pearl, and explained some of the words that had puzzled me. Then she told me that she had a beautiful story about a little boy which she was sure I should like better than, The Scarlet Letter. The name of the story was, Little Lord Fauntleroy, and she promised to read it to me the following summer. But we did not begin the story until August. The first few weeks of my stay at the seashore were so full of discoveries and excitement that I forgot the very existence of books. Then my teacher went to visit some friends in Boston, leaving me for a short time. When she returned almost the first thing we did was to begin the story of, Little Lord Fauntleroy. I recall distinctly the time and place when we read the first chapters of the fascinating child's story. It was a warm afternoon in August. We were sitting together in a hammock which swung from two solemn pines at a short distance from the house. We had hurried through the dish washing after luncheon, in order that we might have as long an afternoon as possible for the story. As we hastened through the long grass toward the hammock, the grasshoppers swarmed about us and fastened themselves on our clothes, and I remember that my teacher insisted upon picking them all off before we sat down, which seemed to me an unnecessary waste of time. The hammock was covered with pine needles, for it had not been used while my teacher was away. The warm sun shone on the pine trees and drew out all their fragrance. The air was balmy, with a tang of the sea in it. Before we began the story Miss Sullivan explained to me the things that she knew I should not understand, and as we read on she explained the unfamiliar words. At first there were many words I did not know, and the reading was constantly interrupted. But as soon as I thoroughly comprehended the situation, I became too eagerly absorbed in the story to notice mere words, and I am afraid I listened impatiently to the explanations that Miss Sullivan felt to be necessary. When her fingers were too tired to spell another word, I had for the first time a keen sense of my deprivations. I took the book in my hands and tried to feel the letters with an intensity of longing that I can never forget. Afterward, at my eager request, Mr. Anagnos had this story embossed, and I read it again and again, until I almost knew it by heart, and all through my childhood, Little Lord Fauntleroy, was my sweet and gentle companion. 
I have given these details at the risk of being tedious, because they are in such vivid contrast with my vague, mutable and confused memories of earlier reading. From, Little Lord Fauntleroy, I date the beginning of my true interest in books. During the next two years I read many books at my home and on my visits to Boston. I cannot remember what they all were, or in what order I read them, but I know that among them were, Greek heroes, La Fontaine's, Fables, Hawthorne's, Wonder Book, Bible Stories, Lamb's, Tales from Shakespeare, A Child's History of England, by Dickens, The Arabian Nights, The Swiss Family Robinson, The Pilgrim's Progress, Robinson Crusoe, Little Women, and Heidi, a beautiful little story which I afterward read in German. I read them in the intervals between study and play with an ever-deepening sense of pleasure. I did not study nor analyze them, I did not know whether they were well written or not, I never thought about style or authorship. They laid their treasures at my feet, and I accepted them as we accept the sunshine and the love of our friends. I loved Little Women, because it gave me a sense of kinship with girls and boys who could see and hear. Circumscribed as my life was in so many ways, I had to look between the covers of books for news of the world that lay outside my own. I did not care especially for The Pilgrim's Progress, which I think I did not finish, or for The Fables. I read La Fontaine's Fables first in an English translation, and enjoyed them only after a half-hearted fashion. Later I read the book again in French, and I found that, in spite of the vivid word pictures, and the wonderful mastery of language, I liked it no better. I do not know why it is, but stories in which animals are made to talk and act like human beings have never appealed to me very strongly. The ludicrous caricatures of the animals occupy my mind to the exclusion of the moral. Then, again, La Fontaine seldom, if ever, appeals to our highest moral sense. The highest chords he strikes are those of reason and self-love. Through all the fables runs the thought that man's morality springs wholly from self-love, and that if that self-love is directed and restrained by reason, happiness must follow. Now, so far as I can judge, self-love is the root of all evil, but, of course, I may be wrong, for La Fontaine had greater opportunities of observing men than I am likely ever to have. I do not object so much to the cynical and satirical fables as to those in which momentous truths are taught by monkeys and foxes. But I love, The Jungle Book, and, wild animals I have known. I feel a genuine interest in the animals themselves, because they are real animals and not caricatures of men. One sympathizes with their loves and hatreds, laughs over their comedies, and weeps over their tragedies. And if they point a moral, it is so subtle that we are not conscious of it. My mind opened naturally and joyously to a conception of antiquity. Greece, ancient Greece, exercised a mysterious fascination over me. In my fancy the pagan gods and goddesses still walked on earth and talked face to face with men, and in my heart I secretly built shrines to those I loved best. I knew and loved the whole tribe of nymphs and heroes and demigods. No, not quite all, for the cruelty and greed of Medea and Jason were too monstrous to be forgiven and I used to wonder why the gods permitted them to do wrong and then punished them for their wickedness. And the mystery is still unsolved. I often wonder how God can dumbness keep while sin creeps grinning through his house of time. It was the Iliad that made Greece my paradise. I was familiar with the story of Troy before I read it in the original, and consequently I had little difficulty in making the Greek words surrender their treasures after I had passed the borderland of grammar. Great poetry, whether written in Greek or in English, needs no other interpreter than a responsive heart.
Would that the host of those who make the great works of the poets odious by their analysis, impositions and laborious comments might learn this simple truth. It is not necessary that one should be able to define every word and give it its principal parts and its grammatical position in the sentence in order to understand and appreciate a fine poem. I know my learned professors have found greater riches in the Iliad than I shall ever find, but I am not avaricious. I am content that others should be wiser than I. But with all their wide and comprehensive knowledge, they cannot measure their enjoyment of that splendid epic. Nor can I when I read the finest passages of the Iliad, I am conscious of a soul sense that lifts me above the narrow, cramping circumstances of my life. My physical limitations are forgotten. My world lies upward, the length and the breadth and the sweep of the heavens are mine. My admiration for the Aeneid is not so great, but it is none the less real. I read it as much as possible without the help of notes or dictionary, and I always like to translate the episodes that please me especially. The word painting of Virgil is wonderful sometimes, but his gods and men move through the scenes of passion and strife and pity and love like the graceful figures in an Elizabethan mask, whereas in the Iliad they give three leaps and go on singing. Virgil is serene and lovely like a marble Apollo in the moonlight. Homer is a beautiful, animated youth in the full sunlight with the wind in his hair. How easy it is to fly on paper wings. From Greek heroes to the Iliad was no day's journey, nor was it altogether pleasant. One could have traveled round the word many times while I trudged my weary way through the labyrinthine mazes of grammars and dictionaries, or fell into those dreadful pitfalls called examinations, set by schools and colleges for the confusion of those who seek after knowledge. I suppose this sort of pilgrim's progress was justified by the end, but it seemed interminable to me, in spite of the pleasant surprises that met me now and then at a turn in the road. I began to read the Bible long before I could understand it. Now it seems strange to me that there should have been a time when my spirit was deaf to its wondrous harmonies. But I remember well a rainy Sunday morning when, having nothing else to do, I begged my cousin to read me a story out of the Bible. Although she did not think I should understand, she began to spell into my hand the story of Joseph and his brothers. Somehow it failed to interest me. The unusual language and repetition made the story seem unreal and far away in the land of Canaan, and I fell asleep and wandered off to the land of Nod, before the brothers came with the coat of many colors unto the tent of Jacob and told their wicked lie. I cannot understand why the stories of the Greeks should have been so full of charm for me, and those of the Bible so devoid of interest, unless it was that I had made the acquaintance of several Greeks in Boston and been inspired by their enthusiasm for the stories of their country, whereas I had not met a single Hebrew or Egyptian and therefore concluded that they were nothing more than barbarians, and the stories about them were probably all made up, which hypothesis explained the repetitions and the queer names. Curiously enough, it never occurred to me to call Greek patronymics queer, but how shall I speak of the glories I have since discovered in the Bible? For years I have read it with an ever-broadening sense of joy and inspiration, and I love it as I love no other book. Still there is much in the Bible against which every instinct of my being rebels, so much that I regret the necessity which has compelled me to read it through from beginning to end. I do not think that the knowledge which I have gained of its history and sources compensates me for the unpleasant details it has forced upon my attention. For my part, I wish, with Mr. Howells, that the literature of the past might be purged of all that is ugly and barbarous in it, although I should object as much as anyone to having these great works weakened or falsified. 
There is something impressive, awful, in the simplicity and terrible directness of the Book of Esther. Could there be anything more dramatic than the scene in which Esther stands before her wicked lord? She knows her life is in his hands, there is no one to protect her from his wrath. Yet, conquering her woman's fear, she approaches him, animated by the noblest patriotism, having but one thought, if I perish, I perish. But if I live, my people shall live. The story of Ruth, too, how oriental it is. Yet how different is the life of these simple country folks from that of the Persian capital. Ruth is so loyal and gentle-hearted, we cannot help loving her, as she stands with the reapers amid the waving corn. Her beautiful, unselfish spirit shines out like a bright star in the night of a dark and cruel age. Love like Ruth's, love which can rise above conflicting creeds and deep-seated racial prejudices, is hard to find in all the world. The Bible gives me a deep, comforting sense that things seen are temporal, and things unseen are eternal. I do not remember a time since I have been capable of loving books that I have not loved Shakespeare. I cannot tell exactly when I began Lamb's Tales from Shakespeare, but I know that I read them at first with a child's understanding and a child's wonder. Macbeth seems to have impressed me most. One reading was sufficient to stamp every detail of the story upon my memory forever. For a long time the ghosts and witches pursued me even into dreamland. I could see, absolutely see, the dagger and Lady Macbeth's little white hand, the dreadful stain was as real to me as to the grief-stricken queen. I read, King Lear, soon after, Macbeth, and I shall never forget the feeling of horror when I came to the scene in which Gloucester's eyes are put out. Anger seized me, my fingers refused to move, I sat rigid for one long moment, the blood throbbing in my temples, and all the hatred that a child can feel concentrated in my heart. I must have made the acquaintance of Shylock and Satan about the same time, for the two characters were long associated in my mind. I remember that I was sorry for them. I felt vaguely that they could not be good even if they wished to because no one seemed willing to help them or to give them a fair chance. Even now I cannot find it in my heart to condemn them utterly. There are moments when I feel that the Shylocks, the Judases, and even the Devil, are broken spokes in the great wheel of good which shall in due time be made whole. It seems strange that my first reading of Shakespeare should have left me so many unpleasant memories. The bright, gentle, fanciful plays, the ones I like best now, appear not to have impressed me at first, perhaps because they reflected the habitual sunshine and gaiety of a child's life. But, there is nothing more capricious than the memory of a child, what it will hold, and what it will lose. I have since read Shakespeare's plays many times and know parts of them by heart, but I cannot tell which of them I like best. My delight in them is as varied as my moods. The little songs and the sonnets have a meaning for me as fresh and wonderful as the dramas. But, with all my love for Shakespeare, it is often weary work to read all the meanings into his lines which critics and commentators have given them. I used to try to remember their interpretations, but they discouraged and vexed me. So I made a secret compact with myself not to try any more. This compact I have only just broken in my study of Shakespeare under Professor Kittredge. I know there are many things in Shakespeare, and in the world, that I do not understand, and I am glad to see veil after veil lift gradually, revealing new realms of thought and beauty. Next to poetry I love history. I have read every historical work that I have been able to lay my hands on, from a catalogue of dry facts and drier dates to Green's impartial, picturesque, history of the English people, from Freeman's, history of Europe, to Emerton's, Middle Ages. 
The first book that gave me any real sense of the value of history was Swinton's World History, which I received on my 13th birthday. Though I believe it is no longer considered valid, yet I have kept it ever since as one of my treasures. From it I learned how the races of men spread from land to land and built great cities, how a few great rulers, earthly titans, put everything under their feet, and with a decisive word opened the gates of happiness for millions and closed them upon millions more, how different nations pioneered in art and knowledge and broke ground for the mightier growths of coming ages, how civilization underwent as it were, the holocaust of a degenerate age, and rose again, like the phoenix, among the nobler sons of the north, and how by liberty, tolerance and education the great and the wise have opened the way for the salvation of the whole world. In my college reading I have become somewhat familiar with French and German literature. The German puts strength before beauty and truth before convention, both in life and in literature. There is a vehement, sledgehammer vigor about everything that he does. When he speaks, it is not to impress others, but because his heart would burst if he did not find an outlet for the thoughts that burn in his soul. Then, too, there is in German literature a fine reserve which I like, but its chief glory is the recognition I find in it of the redeeming potency of woman's self-sacrificing love. This thought pervades all German literature and is mystically expressed in Goethe's Faust all things transitory but as symbols are sent. Earth's Chapter 22 I trust that my readers have not concluded from the preceding chapter on books that reading is my only pleasure. My pleasures and amusements are many and varied. More than once in the course of my story I have referred to my love of the country and out-of-door sports. When I was quite a little girl, I learned to row and swim, and during the summer, when I am at Rentham, Massachusetts, I almost live in my boat. Nothing gives me greater pleasure than to take my friends out rowing when they visit me. Of course, I cannot guide the boat very well. Someone usually sits in the stern and manages the rudder while I row. Sometimes, however, I go rowing without the rudder. It is fun to try to steer by the scent of water grasses and lilies, and of bushes that grow on the shore. I use oars with leather bands, which keep them in position in the oar locks, and I know by the resistance of the water when the oars are evenly poised. In the same manner I can also tell when I am pulling against the current. I like to contend with wind and wave. What is more exhilarating than to make your staunch little boat, obedient to your will and muscle, go skimming lightly over glistening, tilting waves, and to feel the steady, imperious surge of the water? I also enjoy canoeing, and I suppose you will smile when I say that I especially like it on moonlight nights. I cannot, it is true, see the moon climb up the sky behind the pines and steal softly across the heavens, making a shining path for us to follow. But I know she is there, and as I lie back among the pillows and put my hand in the water, I fancy that I feel the shimmer of her garments as she passes. Sometimes a daring little fish slips between my fingers, and often a pond lily presses shyly against my hand. Frequently, as we emerge from the shelter of a cove or inlet, I am suddenly conscious of the spaciousness of the air about me. A luminous warmth seems to enfold me. Whether it comes from the trees which have been heated by the sun, or from the water, I can never discover. I have had the same strange sensation even in the heart of the city. I have felt it on cold, stormy days and at night. It is like the kiss of warm lips on my face. My favorite amusement is sailing. In the summer of 1901 I visited Nova Scotia, and had opportunities such as I had not enjoyed before to make the acquaintance of the ocean. After spending a few days in Evangeline's country, about which Longfellow's beautiful poem has woven a spell of enchantment, 
Miss Sullivan and I went to Halifax, where we remained the greater part of the summer. The harbor was our joy, our paradise. What glorious sails we had to Bedford Basin, to McNabb's Island, to York Redoubt, and to the Northwest Arm. And at night what soothing, wondrous hours we spent in the shadow of the great, silent men of war. Oh, it was all so interesting, so beautiful. The memory of it is a joy forever. One day we had a thrilling experience. There was a regatta in the Northwest Arm, in which the boats from the different warships were engaged. We went in a sailboat along with many others to watch the races. Hundreds of little sailboats swung to and fro close by, and the sea was calm. When the races were over, and we turned our faces homeward, one of the party noticed a black cloud drifting in from the sea, which grew and spread and thickened until it covered the whole sky. The wind rose, and the waves chopped angrily at unseen barriers. Our little boat confronted the gale fearlessly. With sails spread and ropes taut, she seemed to sit upon the wind. Now she swirled in the billows, now she sprang upward on a gigantic wave, only to be driven down with angry howl and hiss. Down came the mainsail. Tacking and jibbing, we wrestled with opposing winds that drove us from side to side with impetuous fury. Our hearts beat fast, and our hands trembled with excitement, not fear, for we had the hearts of Vikings, and we knew that our skipper was master of the situation. He had steered through many a storm with firm hand and seawise eye. As they passed us, the large craft and the gunboats in the harbor saluted and the seamen shouted applause for the master of the only little sailboat that ventured out into the storm. At last, cold, hungry and weary, we reached our pier. Last summer I spent in one of the loveliest nooks of one of the most charming villages in New England. Rentham, Massachusetts, is associated with nearly all of my joys and sorrows. For many years Red Farm, by King Philip's Pond, the home of Mr. J. E. Chamberlain and his family, was my home. I remember with deepest gratitude the kindness of these dear friends and the happy days I spent with them. The sweet companionship of their children meant much to me. I joined in all their sports and rambles through the woods and frolics in the water. The prattle of the little ones and their pleasure in the stories I told them of elf and gnome, of hero and wily bear, are pleasant things to remember. Mr. Chamberlain initiated me into the mysteries of tree and wild flower, until with the little ear of love I heard the flow of sap in the oak, and saw the sun glint from leaf to leaf. Thus it is that, even as the roots, shut in the darksome earth, share in the treetops joyance, and conceive, of sunshine and wide air and winged things, by sympathy of nature, so do I, have evidence of things unseen. It seems to me that there is in each of us a capacity to comprehend the impressions and emotions which have been experienced by mankind from the beginning. Each individual has a subconscious memory of the green earth and murmuring waters, and blindness and deafness cannot rob him of this gift from past generations. This inherited capacity is a sort of sixth sense, a soul sense which sees, hears, feels, all in one. I have many tree friends in Rentham. One of them, a splendid oak, is the special pride of my heart. I take all my other friends to see this king tree. It stands on a bluff overlooking King Philip's Pond, and those who are wise in tree lore say it must have stood there 800 or a thousand years. There is a tradition that under this tree King Philip, the heroic Indian chief, gazed his last on earth and sky. I had another tree friend, gentle and more approachable than the great oak a linden that grew in the dooryard at Red Farm. One afternoon, during a terrible thunderstorm, I felt a tremendous crash against the side of the house and knew, even before they told me, that the linden had fallen. 
We went out to see the hero that had withstood so many tempests, and it wrung my heart to see him prostrate who had mightily striven and was now mightily fallen. But I must not forget that I was going to write about last summer in particular. As soon as my examinations were over, Miss Sullivan and I hastened to this green nook, where we have a little cottage on one of the three lakes for which Rentham is famous. Here the long, sunny days were mine, and all thoughts of work and college and the noisy city were thrust into the background. In Rentham we caught echoes of what was happening in the world, war, alliance, social conflict. We heard of the cruel, unnecessary fighting in the faraway Pacific, and learned of the struggles going on between capital and labor. We knew that beyond the border of our Eden men were making history by the sweat of their brows when they might better make a holiday. But we little heeded these things. These things would pass away, here were lakes and woods and broad daisy starred fields and sweet breathed meadows, and they shall endure forever. People who think that all sensations reach us through the eye and the ear have expressed surprise that I should notice any difference, except possibly the absence of pavements, between walking in city streets and in country roads. They forget that my whole body is alive to the conditions about me. The rumble and roar of the city smite the nerves of my face, and I feel the ceaseless tramp of an unseen multitude, and the dissonant tumult frets my spirit. The grinding of heavy wagons on hard pavements and the monotonous clangor of machinery are all the more torturing to the nerves if one's attention is not diverted by the panorama that is always present in the noisy streets to people who can see. In the country one sees only nature's fair works, and one's soul is not saddened by the cruel struggle for mere existence that goes on in the crowded city. Several times I have visited the narrow, dirty streets where the poor live, and I grow hot and indignant to think that good people should be content to live in fine houses and become strong and beautiful while others are condemned to live in hideous, sunless tenements and grow ugly, withered and cringing. The children who crowd these grimy alleys, half-clad and underfed, shrink away from your outstretched hand as if from a blow. Dear little creatures, they crouch in my heart and haunt me with a constant sense of pain. There are men and women, too, all gnarled and bent out of shape. I have felt their hard, rough hands and realized what an endless struggle their existence must be, no more than a series of scrimmages, thwarted attempts to do something. Their life seems an immense disparity between effort and opportunity. The sun and the air are God's free gifts to all we say, but are they so? In yonder city's dingy alleys the sun shines not, and the air is foul. Oh, man, how dost thou forget and obstruct thy brother man, and say, Give us this day our daily bread, when he has none. Oh, would that men would leave the city, its splendor and its tumult and its gold, and return to wood and field and simple, honest living. Then would their children grow stately as noble trees, and their thoughts sweet and pure as wayside flowers. It is impossible not to think of all this when I return to the country after a year of work in town. What a joy it is to feel the soft, springy earth under my feet once more, to follow grassy roads that lead to ferny brooks where I can bathe my fingers in a cataract of rippling notes, or to clamber over a stone wall into green fields that tumble and roll and climb in riotous gladness. Next to a leisurely walk I enjoy a spin on my tandem bicycle. It is splendid to feel the wind blowing in my face and the springy motion of my iron steed. The rapid rush through the air gives me a delicious sense of strength and buoyancy, and the exercise makes my pulses dance and my heart sing. Whenever it is possible, my dog accompanies me on a walk or ride or sail. I have had many dog friends, huge mastiffs, soft-eyed spaniels, wood-wise setters and honest, 
homely bull terriers. At present the lord of my affections is one of these bull terriers. He has a long pedigree, a crooked tail and the drollest, fizz, in dogdom. My dog friends seem to understand my limitations, and always keep close beside me when I am alone. I love their affectionate ways and the eloquent wag of their tails. When a rainy day keeps me indoors, I amuse myself after the manner of other girls. I like to knit and crochet. I read in the happy-go-lucky way I love, here and there a line, or perhaps I play a game or two of checkers or chess with a friend. I have a special board on which I play these games. The squares are cut out, so that the men stand in them firmly. The black checkers are flat and the white ones curved on top. Each checker has a hole in the middle in which a brass knob can be placed to distinguish the king from the commons. The chessmen are of two sizes, the white larger than the black, so that I have no trouble in following my opponent's maneuvers by moving my hands lightly over the board after a play. The jar made by shifting the men from one hole to another tells me when it is my turn. If I happen to be all alone and in an idle mood, I play a game of solitaire, of which I am very fond. I use playing cards marked in the upper right-hand corner with braille symbols which indicate the value of the card. If there are children around, nothing pleases me so much as to frolic with them. I find even the smallest child excellent company, and I am glad to say that children usually like me. They lead me about and show me the things they are interested in. Of course the little ones cannot spell on their fingers, but I manage to read their lips. If I do not succeed they resort to dumb show. Sometimes I make a mistake and do the wrong thing. A burst of childish laughter greets my blunder, and the pantomime begins all over again. I often tell them stories or teach them a game, and the winged hours depart and leave us good and happy. Museums and art stores are also sources of pleasure and inspiration. Doubtless it will seem strange to many that the hand unaided by sight can feel action, sentiment, beauty in the cold marble. And yet it is true that I derive genuine pleasure from touching great works of art. As my fingertips trace line and curve, they discover the thought and emotion which the artist has portrayed. I can feel in the faces of gods and heroes hate, courage and love, just as I can detect them in living faces I am permitted to touch. I feel in Diana's posture the grace and freedom of the forest and the spirit that tames the mountain lion and subdues the fiercest passions. My soul delights in the repose and gracious curves of the Venus, and in Bar's bronzes the secrets of the jungle are revealed to me. A medallion of Homer hangs on the wall of my study, conveniently low, so that I can easily reach it and touch the beautiful, sad face with loving reverence. How well I know each line in that majestic brow, tracks of life and bitter evidences of struggle and sorrow, those sightless eyes seeking, even in the cold plaster, for the light and the blue skies of his beloved Hellas, but seeking in vain, that beautiful mouth, firm and true and tender. It is the face of a poet, and of a man acquainted with sorrow. Ah, how well I understand his deprivation, the perpetual night in which he dwelt, O oh dark, dark, amid the blaze of noon, irrecoverably dark, total eclipse without all hope of day. In imagination I can hear Homer singing, as with unsteady, hesitating steps he gropes his way from camp to camp, singing of life, of love, of war, of the splendid achievements of a noble race. It was a wonderful, glorious song, and it won the blind poet an immortal crown, the admiration of all ages. I sometimes wonder if the hand is not more sensitive to the beauties of sculpture than the eye. I should think the wonderful rhythmical flow of lines and curves could be more subtly felt than seen. 
Be this as it may, I know that I can feel the heart throbs of the ancient Greeks in their marble gods and goddesses. Another pleasure, which comes more rarely than the others, is going to the theater. I enjoy having a play described to me while it is being acted on the stage far more than reading it, because then it seems as if I were living in the midst of stirring events. It has been my privilege to meet a few great actors and actresses who have the power of so bewitching you that you forget time and place and live again in the romantic past. I have been permitted to touch the face and costume of Miss Ellen Terry as she impersonated our ideal of a queen, and there was about her that divinity that hedges sublimest woe. Beside her stood Sir Henry Irving, wearing the symbols of kingship, and there was majesty of intellect in his every gesture and attitude and the royalty that subdues and overcomes in every line of his sensitive face. In the king's face, which he wore as a mask, there was a remoteness and inaccessibility of grief which I shall never forget. I also know Mr. Jefferson. I am proud to count him among my friends. I go to see him whenever I happen to be where he is acting. The first time I saw him act was while at school in New York. He played Rip Van Winkle. I had often read the story, but I had never felt the charm of Rip's slow, quaint, kind ways as I did in the play. Mr. Jefferson's beautiful, pathetic representation quite carried me away with delight. I have a picture of old Rip in my fingers which they will never lose. After the play Miss Sullivan took me to see him behind the scenes, and I felt of his curious garb and his flowing hair and beard. Mr. Jefferson let me touch his face so that I could imagine how he looked on waking from that strange sleep of twenty years, and he showed me how poor old Rip staggered to his feet. I have also seen him in The Rivals. Once while I was calling on him in Boston he acted the most striking parts of the rivals for me. The reception room where we sat served for a stage. He and his son seated themselves at the big table, and Bob Akers wrote his challenge. I followed all his movements with my hands, and caught the drollery of his blunders and gestures in a way that would have been impossible had it all been spelled to me. Then they rose to fight the duel, and I followed the swift thrusts and parries of the swords and the waverings of poor Bob as his courage oozed out at his finger ends. Then the great actor gave his coat a hitch and his mouth a twitch, and in an instant I was in the village of falling water and felt Schneider's shaggy head against my knee. Mr. Jefferson recited the best dialogues of Rip Van Winkle, in which the tear came close upon the smile. He asked me to indicate as far as I could the gestures and action that should go with the lines. Of course, I have no sense whatever of dramatic action, and could make only random guesses, but with masterful art he suited the action to the word. The sigh of Rip as he murmurs, is a man so soon forgotten when he is gone, the dismay with which he searches for dog and gun after his long sleep, and his comical irresolution over signing the contract with Derek. All these seem to be right out of life itself. That is, the ideal life, where things happen as we think they should. I remember well the first time I went to the theater. It was 12 years ago. Elsie Leslie, the little actress, was in Boston, and Miss Sullivan took me to see her in The Prince and the Pauper. I shall never forget the ripple of alternating joy and woe that ran through that beautiful little play, or the wonderful child who acted it. After the play I was permitted to go behind the scenes and meet her in her royal costume. It would have been hard to find a lovelier or more lovable child than Elsie as she stood with a cloud of golden hair floating over her shoulders, smiling brightly, showing no signs of shyness or fatigue, though she had been playing to an immense audience. I was only just learning to speak, and had previously repeated her name until I could say it perfectly. 
Imagine my delight when she understood the few words I spoke to her and without hesitation stretched her hand to greet me. Is it not true, then, that my life with all its limitations touches at many points the life of the world beautiful? Everything has its wonders, even darkness and silence, and I learn, whatever state I may be in, therein to be content. Sometimes, it is true, a sense of isolation enfolds me like a cold mist as I sit alone and wait at life's shut gate. Beyond there is light and music and sweet companionship, but I may not enter. Fate, silent, pitiless, bars the way. Fain would I question his imperious decree, for my heart is still undisciplined and passionate, but my tongue will not utter the bitter, futile words that rise to my lips, and they fall back into my heart like unshed tears. Silence sits immense upon my soul. Then comes hope with a smile and whispers, there is joy in self-forgetfulness. So I try to make the light in others' eyes my sun, the music in others' ears my symphony, the smile on others' lips my happiness. Chapter 23 Would that I could enrich this sketch with the names of all those who have ministered to my happiness. Some of them would be found written in our literature and dear to the hearts of many, while others would be wholly unknown to most of my readers. But their influence, though it escapes fame, shall live immortal in the lives that have been sweetened and ennobled by it. Those are red-letter days in our lives when we meet people who thrill us like a fine poem. People whose handshake is brimful of unspoken sympathy, and whose sweet, rich natures impart to our eager, impatient spirits a wonderful restfulness which, in its essence, is divine. The perplexities irritations and worries that have absorbed us pass like unpleasant dreams, and we wake to see with new eyes and hear with new ears the beauty and harmony of God's real world. The solemn nothings that fill our everyday life blossom suddenly into bright possibilities. In a word, while such friends are near us we feel that all is well. Perhaps we never saw them before and they may never cross our life's path again, but the influence of their calm, mellow natures is a libation poured upon our discontent, and we feel its healing touch. As the ocean feels the mountain stream freshening its brine, I have often been asked, do not people bore you? I do not understand quite what that means. I suppose the calls of the stupid and curious, especially of newspaper reporters, are always inopportune. I also dislike people who try to talk down to my understanding. They are like people who when walking with you try to shorten their steps to suit yours. The hypocrisy in both cases is equally exasperating. The hands of those I meet are dumbly eloquent to me. The touch of some hands is an impertinence. I have met people so empty of joy, that when I clasped their frosty fingertips, it seemed as if I were shaking hands with a northeast storm. Others there are whose hands have sunbeams in them, so that their grasp warms my heart. It may be only the clinging touch of a child's hand, but there is as much potential sunshine in it for me as there is in a loving glance for others. A hearty handshake or a friendly letter gives me genuine pleasure. I have many far-off friends whom I have never seen. Indeed they are so many that I have often been unable to reply to their letters. But I wish to say here that I am always grateful for their kind words, however insufficiently I acknowledge them. I count it one of the sweetest privileges of my life to have known and conversed with many men of genius. Only those who knew Bishop Brooks can appreciate the joy his friendship was to those who possessed it. 
As a child I loved to sit on his knee and clasp his great hand with one of mine. While Miss Sullivan spelled into the other his beautiful words about God and the spiritual world. I heard him with a child's wonder and delight. My spirit could not reach up to his. But he gave me a real sense of joy in life, and I never left him without carrying away a fine thought that grew in beauty and depth of meaning as I grew. Once. When I was puzzled to know why there were so many religions, he said, there is one universal religion, Helen, the religion of love. Love your heavenly father with your whole heart and soul. Love every child of God as much as ever you can, and remember that the possibilities of good are greater than the possibilities of evil. And you have the key to heaven. And his life was a happy illustration of this great truth. In his noble soul love and widest knowledge were blended with faith that had become insight. He saw God in all that liberates and lifts, in all that humbles, sweetens and consoles. Bishop Brooks taught me no special creed or dogma. But he impressed upon my mind two great ideas, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, and made me feel that these truths underlie all creeds and forms of worship. God is love. God is our father, we are his children. Therefore the darkest clouds will break and though right be worsted, wrong shall not triumph. I am too happy in this world to think much about the future. Except to remember that I have cherished friends awaiting me there in God's beautiful somewhere. In spite of the lapse of years. They seem so close to me that I should not think it strange if at any moment they should clasp my hand and speak words of endearment as they used to before they went away. Since Bishop Brooks died I have read the Bible through. Also some philosophical works on religion. Among them Swedenborg's, Heaven and Hell, and Drummond's, Ascent of Man, and I have found no creed or system more soul-satisfying than Bishop Brooks's creed of love. I knew Mr. Henry Drummond, and the memory of his strong, warm handclasp is like a benediction. He was the most sympathetic of companions. He knew so much and was so genial that it was impossible to feel dull in his presence. I remember well the first time I saw Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes. He had invited Miss Sullivan and me to call on him one Sunday afternoon. It was early in the spring, just after I had learned to speak. We were shown at once to his library where we found him seated in a big armchair by an open fire which glowed and crackled on the hearth, thinking, he said, of other days. And listening to the murmur of the river Charles, I suggested. Yes, he replied. The Charles has many dear associations for me. There was an odor of print and leather in the room which told me that it was full of books, and I stretched out my hand instinctively to find them. My fingers lighted upon a beautiful volume of Tennyson's poems, and when Miss Sullivan told me what it was I began to recite, Break, break, break on thy cold gray stones, O sea. But I stopped suddenly. I felt tears on my hand. I had made my beloved poet weep, and I was greatly distressed. He made me sit in his armchair. While he brought different interesting things for me to examine, and at his request I recited, The Chambered Nautilus, which was then my favorite poem. After that I saw Dr. Holmes many times and learned to love the man as well as the poet. One beautiful summer day, not long after my meeting with Dr. Holmes, Miss Sullivan and I visited Whittier in his quiet home on the Merrimack. 
His gentle courtesy and quaint speech won my heart. He had a book of his poems in raised print from which I read in school days. He was delighted that I could pronounce the words so well, and said that he had no difficulty in understanding me. Then I asked many questions about the poem, and read his answers by placing my fingers on his lips. He said he was the little boy in the poem, and that the girl's name was Sally, and more which I have forgotten. I also recited, Laos Deo, and as I spoke the concluding verses, he placed in my hands a statue of a slave from whose crouching figure the fetters were falling. Even as they fell from Peter's limbs when the angel led him forth out of prison. Afterward we went into his study. And he wrote his autograph for my teacher, with great admiration of thy noble work in releasing from bondage the mind of thy dear pupil, I am truly thy friend. John J. Whittier and expressed his admiration of her work, saying to me, She is thy spiritual liberator. Then he led me to the gate and kissed me tenderly on my forehead. I promised to visit him again the following summer, but he died before the promise was fulfilled. Dr. Edward Everett Hale is one of my very oldest friends. I have known him since I was eight and my love for him has increased with my years. His wise, tender sympathy has been the support of Miss Sullivan and me in times of trial and sorrow. And his strong hand has helped us over many rough places, and what he has done for us he has done for thousands of those who have difficult tasks to accomplish. He has filled the old skins of dogma with the new wine of love, and shown men what it is to believe, live and be free. What he has taught we have seen beautifully expressed in his own life, love of country, kindness to the least of his brethren, and a sincere desire to live upward and onward. He has been a prophet and an inspirer of men, and a mighty doer of the word, the friend of all his race, God bless him. I have already written of my first meeting with Dr. Alexander Graham Bell. Since then I have spent many happy days with him at Washington and at his beautiful home in the heart of Cape Breton Island. Near Badek, the village made famous by Charles Dudley Warner's book. Here in Dr. Bell's laboratory, or in the fields on the shore of the Great Bras Door. I have spent many delightful hours listening to what he had to tell me about his experiments, and helping him fly kites by means of which he expects to discover the laws that shall govern the future airship. Dr. Bell is proficient in many fields of science and has the art of making every subject he touches interesting, even the most abstruse theories. He makes you feel that if you only had a little more time, you, too, might be an inventor. He has a humorous and poetic side, too. His dominating passion is his love for children. He is never quite so happy as when he has a little deaf child in his arms. His labors in behalf of the deaf will live on and bless generations of children yet to come. And we love him alike for what he himself has achieved and for what he has evoked from others. During the two years I spent in New York I had many opportunities to talk with distinguished people whose names I had often heard, but whom I had never expected to meet. Most of them I met first in the house of my good friend, Mr. Lawrence Hutton. It was a great privilege to visit him and dear Mrs. Hutton in their lovely home, and see their library and read the beautiful sentiments and bright thoughts gifted friends had written for them. It has been truly said that Mr. 
Hutton has the faculty of bringing out in everyone the best thoughts and kindest sentiments. One does not need to read, a boy I knew, to understand him, the most generous, sweet-natured boy I ever knew, a good friend in all sorts of weather, who traces the footprints of love in the life of dogs as well as in that of his fellowmen. Mrs. Hutton is a true and tried friend. Much that I hold sweetest, much that I hold most precious, I owe to her. She has oftenest advised and helped me in my progress through college. When I find my work particularly difficult and discouraging, she writes me letters that make me feel glad and brave. For she is one of those from whom we learn that one painful duty fulfilled makes the next plainer and easier. Mr. Hutton introduced me to many of his literary friends, greatest of whom are Mr. William Dean Howells and Mark Twain. I also met Mr. Richard Watson Gilder and Mr. Edmund Clarence Stedman. I also knew Mr. Charles Dudley Warner. The most delightful of storytellers and the most beloved friend, whose sympathy was so broad that it may be truly said of him, he loved all living things and his neighbor as himself. Once Mr. Warner brought to see me the dear poet of the woodlands, Mr. John Burroughs. They were all gentle and sympathetic and I felt the charm of their manner as much as I had felt the brilliancy of their essays and poems. I could not keep pace with all these literary folk as they glanced from subject to subject and entered into deep dispute, or made conversation sparkle with epigrams and happy witticisms. I was like little Ascanius, who followed with unequal steps the heroic strides of Aeneas on his march toward mighty destinies. But they spoke many gracious words to me. Mr. Gilder told me about his moonlight journeys across the vast desert to the pyramids, and in a letter he wrote me he made his mark under his signature deep in the paper so that I could feel it. This reminds me that Dr. Hale used to give a personal touch to his letters to me by pricking his signature in Braille. I read from Mark Twain's lips one or two of his good stories. He has his own way of thinking, saying and doing everything. I feel the twinkle of his eye in his handshake. Even while he utters his cynical wisdom in an indescribably droll voice. He makes you feel that his heart is a tender Iliad of human sympathy. There are a host of other interesting people I met in New York. Mrs. Mary Mapes Dodge the beloved editor of St. Nicholas, and Mrs. Riggs, Kate Douglas Wiggin, the sweet author of Patsy. I received from them gifts that have the gentle concurrence of the heart, books containing their own thoughts, soul-illumined letters, and photographs that I love to have described again and again. But there is not space to mention all my friends, and indeed there are things about them hidden behind the wings of cherubim. Things too sacred to set forth in cold print. It is with hesitancy that I have spoken even of Mrs. Lawrence Hutton. I shall mention only two other friends. One is Mrs. William Thaw, of Pittsburgh whom I have often visited in her home, Lyndhurst. She is always doing something to make someone happy. And her generosity and wise counsel have never failed my teacher and me in all the years we have known her. To the other friend I am also deeply indebted. He is well known for the powerful hand with which he guides vast enterprises, and his wonderful abilities have gained for him the respect of all. Kind to everyone, he goes about doing good. Silent and unseen. Again I touch upon the circle of honored names I must not mention. 
but I would fain acknowledge his generosity and affectionate interest which make it possible for me to go to college. Thus it is that my friends have made the story of my life. In a thousand ways they have turned my limitations into beautiful privileges, and enabled me to walk serene and happy in the shadow cast by my deprivation. 25. University Life The descriptions I have provided above depict my freshman year in college. Now, let me share with you the circumstances of my sophomore year and beyond. The section, Girlhood, is a compilation of my essays written during my freshman year at DeCliff College. Back then, in Professor Keelan's composition class, I would write one essay every week. Initially, I had no plans to organize them for publication until one day, the editor-in-chief of Ladies' Gazette unexpectedly visited. He said, our publisher would like to feature your biography in our magazine as a serialized publication. Please provide us with your assistance. Understanding their intention, I politely declined, citing my busy academic schedule. However, he persisted, saying, haven't you already written a lot in your composition class? Surprised by his remark, I asked, Ah, oh, how did you even know about that? He laughed and replied, well, that's because it's my profession. He seemed somewhat proud. Then, he informed me that with a few modifications to the school essays, they could become the magazine's desired articles very easily. Reluctantly, I agreed to serialize the original manuscript of Girlhood in Ladies' Gazette for the price of $3,000 and signed the contract. To be honest, I was tempted by the sum of $3,000 and forgot that the manuscript was only halfway completed. I didn't consider the potential challenges that writing the latter half might bring. At that time, I was somewhat carried away and made the decision without much thought. Initially, everything went smoothly, but as time went on, it became increasingly challenging. I had no idea what to write, especially since I was not a professional writer. I didn't know how to process the existing material appropriately to fit the magazine's requirements. I was also oblivious to the importance of deadlines, completely acting like an amateur. When I received telegrams from the magazine, such as, please send the next chapter immediately, or, the relationship between pages 6 and 7 is unclear, please explain by return telegram, I was completely at a loss. Fortunately, my classmate, Lenoa, introduced me to someone. She told me, he is a classmate of our landlord, not only is he clear-minded, but he is also generous and chivalrous. If you ask him for help, he will surely not refuse. That's how I met Mr. Macy. Mr. Macy was a professor at Harper University, also teaching at DeCliff College at the time, although I was unaware of it. After hearing Lenoa's introduction, I had an initially favorable impression of Mr. Macy. Through our subsequent interactions, I deeply experienced what Lenoa had said. Mr. Macy was not only intelligent and wise but also warm-hearted. After understanding my difficulties, he promptly reviewed the materials I brought and efficiently helped me organize them. From then on, I was finally able to submit my manuscripts on time. Mr. Macy was a talented and emotionally rich literary figure. To me, he was not only a good friend but also a trustworthy elder brother, an indispensable person to consult with in times of need. If the quality of this current writing falls short of the past, I wouldn't find it surprising at all as there is no Mr. Macy available to assist me this time. As mentioned earlier, the most troubling aspect of my education at DeCliff was the lack of braille books to read, and another issue was the inadequate allocation of time. 
Sally Wen, my teacher, would convey extracurricular assignments to me through sign language, often requiring me to study until late at night while others were already fast asleep. Mr. Locke and Mr. Vidu would use their fingers to point out words on my textbooks, but some teachers hadn't taught me how to study even until class time, making it difficult for me to keep up with the progress. Now, the Red Cross has published thousands of Braille books for the blind, editor's note, referring to 1928, allowing me to read many, many books. But back then, all of my Braille books combined didn't exceed a few volumes, and each one was a priceless treasure to me. I would bow my head and read these books with my own hands, collecting materials for my essays and preparing for exams. Whenever I read Braille books, I would often think to myself, now I can study independently without needing anyone's help. It brought me great comfort. In terms of academics, whether it was literature or history, I could effortlessly read and comprehend them. Perhaps this was related to my experiences in girlhood, as I had encountered numerous beautifully written, imaginative, and knowledge-filled articles long before entering university. Therefore, I had a strong interest in these courses, and my academic performance was excellent. Looking back now, I am truly grateful for my fortunate circumstances. One regret I have is not engaging in more conversations with the professors during my university years. Most of the lectures from the professors felt mechanical to me, like listening to a phonograph. Professor Briggs, the dean, lived next door to me, but I never took the initiative to visit him. Dr. Ellsworth, who signed my graduation certificate, never had the chance to meet me either. Only Professor Cobrin, who guided my writing class, Dr. Nelson, who taught Elizabethan literature, and Professor Padrett, who taught German, occasionally invited me for tea, and they were always friendly when they encountered me outside of school. Due to my unique physical condition, I couldn't play harmoniously with my classmates in the class. However, they found various ways to communicate and interact with me. My classmates often went together to restaurants outside, eating sandwiches and drinking cocoa milk. They would gather around me, sharing amusing stories to make me laugh. They even elected me as the vice class monitor. If it weren't for the demanding coursework that required me to spend more time than others and found it challenging, I believe my university life could have been as vibrant and colorful as my fellow classmates. One day, my friends invited me out, saying, Helen, would you like to visit a friend's house in the bustling district of Brooklyn? But in the end, we ended up at a pet store in Boston that was full of terrier dogs. Those dogs warmly welcomed me, and one in particular, named Count Thomas, was especially affectionate towards me. This little dog wasn't particularly attractive in appearance, but it knew how to be endearing, standing beside me with a submissive and obedient demeanor. When I reached out to touch it, it wagged its tail excitedly and let out a low, joyful bark. Ah. Count Thomas, do you like Helen very much? Helen, do you also like this little dog? My friends asked in unison, and I promptly replied, yes, I really like it. In that case, we'll give this dog to you as a gift from all of us, my friends said. Count Thomas seemed to understand that everyone was discussing it, circling around me. Once Count Thomas calmed down a bit, I said, I don't like this title of Count. It sounds unattainable. After I spoke these words, the dog seemed to comprehend and silently sat down beside me, becoming quiet. Look, how about the name Fizz? As soon as these words were uttered, Count Thomas seemed to completely agree, happily rolling on the ground three times. So I brought this dog back to our home in Cambridge. At that time, we lived at 14 Cooley's Street, renting a part of the house. 
It was said that this house used to be a luxurious residence, situated on a beautiful hill covered in lush, green trees. Although the main entrance faced the street, the house was set back deeply, and the noise of vehicles on the road could hardly be heard. Behind the house was a large garden, where the owner planted a variety of flowers, including tricolor violets, geraniums, and carnations. The fragrance of flowers permeated the house. Every morning, those Italian girls dressed in vibrant attire would come to pick flowers and sell them in the market. We would often wake up to the lively laughter and songs of those Italian girls, feeling as if we were in a pastoral village in Italy. During my time on Cooley Street, we became acquainted with several students and young lecturers from Habit University, and we got along very well, becoming good friends. One of them was Mr. Philip Smith, who is currently the director of the Alaska branch of the Washington National Geological Survey. His wife, Rainoa, was one of my best classmates. Rainoa was very kind to me. Whenever our teacher, Miss Sally, wasn't feeling well, she would help me with my homework and accompany me to the classroom. Mr. John Messy was also one of the members at that time, and he was once a pillar of support in my life and spirit. Later on, he married Miss Sally. The young people were full of energy and vitality, often walking for miles along the country roads without feeling tired at all. Sometimes we would ride a three-seater bicycle and travel up to 40 miles before finally deciding to return home. It was truly a carefree age. We were happy doing anything and delighted with every game. In the eyes of the youth, everything in nature was so wonderful. The warm autumn sun shining through the treetops, flocks of migratory birds flying south, squirrels busily collecting and storing walnuts for the rainy season, ripe fruits falling from apple trees, pink flowers on the grassy riverbanks, and the shimmering green river water. Everything was delightful and enchanting. On cool winter nights, we would rent a carriage with a canopy and wander around, go sledding on the mountains, play wildly in the wilderness, sit quietly in a cafe savoring rich coffee, or indulge in a delicious late-night snack. We were as happy as immortals. During those winter nights, we would sometimes gather around a blazing fire for several consecutive nights, drinking cola, eating popcorn, engaging in lively discussions, and exploring various social, literary, and philosophical issues. No matter what topic we discussed, we always enjoyed delving deep into the root causes. A group of young people began to understand the importance of independent thinking and possessed a strong sense of justice. They couldn't tolerate the evil forces and dark side of society. They all shared a love for peace and humanity. However, mere discussions were often futile and couldn't solve fundamental problems. Merely envisioning an ideal utopia was meaningless. Yet, no one dared to express a different opinion as the more impulsive radicals were eager to challenge any traitors. The radiance of youth was so dazzling that it was almost blinding. The fearless vigor they possessed was truly enviable. I remember one time we walked to a distant place, and the winds of March were so strong that they blew my hat off. Another time, probably in April, we set off on foot again, only to be caught in a pouring rainstorm. Several of us had to huddle together under a small raincoat. In May, we all went together to the countryside to pick strawberries, and the fragrance of strawberries filled the air. Oh, I am not yet at the age of an old lady, so why am I constantly reminiscing about the past years? In these fleeting days of joy, four years of university life passed by in the blink of an eye, and we were finally approaching the graduation ceremony. At that time, the newspapers reported on me and Miss Sally during the graduation ceremony. One newspaper carried the following headline, On this day, 
The auditorium of the graduation ceremony was packed to the brim. Of course, every graduate present would receive their diploma, but the attention of the guests was focused on one student, the beautiful and academically outstanding Helen Keller, who is blind. Miss Sally, who has tirelessly assisted this young girl, also shared in her honor. When the MC announced the name Helen Keller, thunderous applause erupted throughout the venue. This young girl not only completed all the courses at the university with outstanding results but also excelled in the subject of English literature, earning praise and admiration from her teachers and classmates. Miss Sally, my teacher, was delighted that I achieved high marks in English literature. It was all thanks to her. However, apart from these two facts, the rest of the newspaper reports were utter nonsense. The guests present that day were not as numerous as the journalists claimed. In fact, only five or six close friends came specifically to attend my graduation ceremony. Unfortunately, my mother couldn't attend the ceremony due to illness. The principal gave a routine speech and didn't specifically mention me or Miss Sally. Moreover, the other teachers didn't come over to greet me either. Furthermore, when I went on stage to receive my diploma, there was no thunderous applause, as the newspaper claimed. In short, the graduation ceremony was not as grand and unprecedented as described in the newspapers. Some of my classmates sympathized with Miss Sally and, while taking off their graduation gowns, angrily exclaimed, it's too hasty. They should have awarded a degree to Miss Sally as well. After the graduation ceremony, the teacher accompanied me out of the auditorium and we directly boarded a car to our planned new residence in New England. That evening, my friends and I went canoeing on Lake Oro Monopoyig. Under the serene and peaceful starry sky, we temporarily forgot all the troubles of the world. The newspaper that exaggerated the graduation ceremony also claimed that my residence in Lashan was a gift from the Boston city government, with spacious grounds and filled with bronze sculptures given to me by others. It even said that I had a giant library with tens of thousands of books, creating a book city, and living a very comfortable life. It was all pure nonsense. The house where Miss Sally and I lived was far from luxurious. In fact, it was an old farmhouse that had been purchased long ago, with seven acres of long abandoned land surrounding it. The teacher had connected the milking parlor with the pottery storage room, turning it into a large room that served as a makeshift study. There were about a hundred books in braille in the study. Although it was quite simple, I felt completely satisfied. The room had ample light, and I could place potted plants on the window sill, with two sliding glass doors offering a view of the distant pine forest. Miss Sally even specially built a small balcony next to my bedroom so that I could go out for a walk when I felt happy. It was on this balcony that I first heard the birds singing the Song of Love. That day, I enjoyed the gentle breeze on the balcony so much that I didn't want to go inside and stayed there for over an hour. On the southern side of the balcony, there was a vine climbing up the railing, while on the northern side, there were apple trees. The intoxicating fragrance of apple blossoms filled the air when they bloomed. Suddenly, I felt a slight vibration in the hand that was holding onto the railing. This vibration gave me a feeling similar to resting my hand on a musician's throat. The vibrations came and went in waves, and in a moment of pause, a petal fell down, lightly brushing against my cheek before landing on the ground. I immediately speculated that a bird had flown by or a gentle breeze had caused the petal to fall. While I was pondering, the railing began to vibrate again. What could it be? I stood there quietly, lost in thought and feeling. At that moment, Miss Sally reached out her hand from the window, 
silently signaling me not to move. She held onto my hand and whispered, there is a female mosquito bird perched right next to you on the railing. If you move, it will fly away, so it's best to stand still. Miss Sally conveyed this information to me through sign language. The bird's call sounded like, Fei Pu A Wei, Fei Pu A Wei. I focused my attention on the bird's call, and eventually, I was able to distinguish its rhythm and melody while sensing that its call was gradually increasing and becoming faster. Miss Sally once again passed a message to me, saying, the bird's lover is now perched on the apple tree and singing in harmony with it. Perhaps the bird has been there for a while. Oh, look, now they are starting a duet. After a momentary pause, she continued, now, the two birds are whispering sweet nothings to each other amidst the apple blossoms. This farmhouse was acquired through the exchange of shares in the sugar company gifted to me by Mr. Spaulding ten years ago. During our most difficult times, Mr. Spaulding extended a helping hand to us. I was only nine years old when I first met him, accompanied by the child star, Letty. At that time, Letty was performing in the play, The Little Princess. Since then, whenever we faced difficulties, Mr. Spaulding spared no effort in assisting us, often visiting Perkins School for the Blind to check on us. Each time he visited, he would bring roses, cookies, and fruits to share with everyone. Sometimes, he would treat us to a lunch outing or rent a carriage to take us on a trip, and Letty would often accompany us. Letty was a beautiful and lively little girl, and Mr. Spaulding would often say to the two of us, you are my dearest little ladies, watching us play together with great joy. At that time, I was learning how to communicate with people, but Mr. Spaulding always had difficulty understanding me, which filled me with regret. One day, I decided to practice saying Letty's name repeatedly, hoping to surprise Mr. Spaulding. However, no matter how hard I practiced, I couldn't say Letty's full name correctly, and I became frustrated and cried. When Mr. Spaulding finally arrived, I couldn't wait to show him my progress, repeating it over and over again. Finally, after many attempts, I managed to convey my message, and I was overjoyed and deeply moved. I still cannot forget that overwhelming feeling of excitement. From then on, whenever I couldn't express myself clearly or when the surroundings were too noisy for Mr. Spaulding to communicate with me, he would embrace me tightly and softly reassure me, saying, although I may not fully understand what you mean, I like you, and I will always like you the most. Until his passing, Mr. Spaulding continued to send us a monthly allowance to support me and Miss Sally. When he gave us the shares of the sugar company, he instructed us to sell them if we needed to. Because of this, when Miss Sally and I stepped into this house for the first time, opened the windows, and began our new life, it felt as if Mr. Spaulding was with us. In the second year after graduating from university, on May 2, 1905, Miss Sally married Mr. Macy. For a long time, I had hoped that Miss Sally would meet a good person and find a happy home, so I sincerely felt joy and wholeheartedly wished them everlasting happiness in their marriage. The wedding was officiated by our friend, Dr. Edward Hale, and took place in a beautiful White House. After the ceremony, the newlywed couple went on their honeymoon to New Orleans, while my mother took me back to the South for a vacation. Six or seven days later, the Macy couple suddenly appeared at the hotel where my mother and I were staying, surprising us greatly. Seeing my two most beloved individuals amidst the scenery of early summer in the South was an unexpected delight, as if it were a dream. Mr. Macy told me, this area is filled with the fragrance of magnolia flowers, accompanied by the most delightful bird songs. Perhaps these birdsong melodies were regarded by the honeymooning couple as the best wishes for their new marriage.
Finally, the four of us returned to the house in Liantian together. I vaguely heard some gossip and speculations. Miss Sally got married, and poor Helen must be heartbroken, maybe even jealous. Some people even wrote letters to comfort me based on such assumptions. However, they couldn't have imagined that I not only didn't feel heartbroken or jealous but that my days were happier and more fulfilling than ever before. Miss Sally is a noble-hearted, kind, and honest person, and Mr. Macy is also a gentle and enthusiastic individual. His storytelling often made me burst into laughter, and he would frequently impart knowledge and scientific discoveries that I should be aware of. Occasionally, we would discuss current literary trends. Once, I experienced a delay in my writing due to a typewriter malfunction, and to meet the deadline, Mr. Macy stayed up all night to type out 40 pages for me. At that time, I was invited to contribute an article titled, Common Sense and Random Thoughts, for the Century magazine, describing various trivial matters around me. Since Queen Jane Austen had previously written a book with the same title, when I compiled the manuscript for publication, I changed the title to, The World I Live In. In the process of writing, my emotions have always been in the best state. This is the most enjoyable book I have written. I write about the charming scenery of New England and discuss the philosophical questions that come to my mind. In short, whatever comes to mind, I write about it. The next book is, Songs of the Stone Wall, a collection of poems inspired by the countryside. One day, we went to the countryside to repair an ancient stone wall. The breath of spring and the joy of labor gave birth in my heart to songs praising the joy of spring. While organizing these poems, Mr. Macy provided me with great assistance. He candidly pointed out areas he was dissatisfied with and generously praised the lines he admired. And so, each poem went through multiple recitations, careful considerations, and countless revisions. Mr. Macy often said, we have put our hearts and honesty into this. If there are still flaws, there's nothing more we can do. After arriving in Liantian, the thought of my father's farm in Alabama crossed our minds, and we began to entertain the idea of raising livestock and farming, embracing a simple rural life. Initially, all we had was Fizz, the dog we brought with us from Cambridge. Fizz passed away a little over a year after we moved here, and later, we gradually acquired a few more dogs. We once bought some chicks from a nearby poultry farm to raise. Each of us enthusiastically took care of them. However, these chicks proved to be quite embarrassing for us, and our plan soon ended in failure. Feeling it was a waste to leave several empty rooms, we decided to convert them into stables for horses. We purchased a wild and fierce horse, completely untamed. On the way, the delivery boy fell off the horse two or three times. However, he never mentioned a word about it when he handed the horse over to us, and we remained completely unaware. Early the next morning, Mr. Macy led the horse out, hitched it to the wagon, and set off for town. Just a few steps out of the gate, the horse suddenly went berserk. Mr. Macy found it strange and thought there might be a problem with the harness, so he got off to inspect it. Just as Mr. Macy was about to remove the cart from the horse, the horse stood up on its hind legs, let out a long neigh, and then bolted away at full speed. Two days later, a nearby farmer spotted a horse wearing the harness wandering in the forest and brought it back. Left with no choice, we had to sell the horse, which we had retrieved, to a professional horse trainer. During that time, our financial situation was rather tight, and someone suggested we plant apple trees. So, we bought 100 saplings and began planting apples. 
By the fifth year, the trees started bearing fruit, and I was thrilled, noting down the quantity and size of the apples in my notebook. One afternoon, a servant rushed in frantically and shouted, Oh no! Bison! Bison! Upon hearing the news, we immediately ran to the window to see what was happening. It wasn't bison, it turned out to be wild deer coming down from the nearby mountains. It seemed like the whole family had come out. A deer couple with three fawns came to frolic in our apple orchard. Their lively and leaping figures under the sunlight were so wonderfully enchanting that we were all mesmerized. However, at that very moment, these unexpected guests audaciously wreaked havoc. Once the deer left, everyone ventured out to assess the damage, and upon seeing it, we were all left dumbfounded. Oh, dear God, only five or six apple trees out of the hundred remained, and so, all our various agricultural and livestock plans failed. However, in my memories, it was a period of life that was both interesting and fulfilling. In the yard, the apple trees that Mr. Macy took special care of grew well and bore abundant fruit. Every autumn, when the fruit ripened, I would take a ladder and go apple picking, filling one wooden barrel after another. When we all pitched in to tidy up the garden, I patiently gathered the dry branches from the ground and bundled them into stacks of firewood. Mr. Macy also came up with a clever idea. He tied iron wires to the tree trunks along the outdoor path leading to the hillside. This way, I could hold onto the wire and walk into the forest alone. Inside the forest, there were tall autumn gentians and blooming wild carrots. The wire path was about four to five hundred meters long, which means I could walk that far all by myself without needing anyone's company and without the fear of getting lost. This matter held extraordinary significance for me, and even now, the thought of it fills me with excitement. Many things may seem insignificant to ordinary people, but I derived great enjoyment from them, experiencing the taste of freedom. I would often go out alone to bask in the sun, and my mood would become incredibly joyful. All of this was granted to me by Mr. Macy, and I am sincerely grateful to him. During the time in Lianchen from 1905 to 1911, there were no cars, no planes, no radios, and news of wars happening elsewhere was unheard of. Everyone lived a peaceful and leisurely life. Now, residing in the present world, looking back at the past, I feel an infinite sense of nostalgia, as if it were a completely different lifetime.